sharing now and the webinar is starting. Okay, Alex. Thanks, so I'll call to order the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for July 10th, 2023. Before we get to business, we'll go over our ground rules for the virtual meeting. All right, I'm gonna start sharing screens. Let me know if you can see it. Oops. Yes. All right, cool. Well, we're pleased to have you join us today. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meetings are prohibited. The time for speaking is limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using the person's real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. Please use the raise hand function to be recognized for the public comment. If you're on the phone, you will need to press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rules. The Q&A function is enabled. It will be used for individuals to communicate with the host it can be used for technical or online platform related questions only. If an, if an attendee attempts to chat for any other reasons that are the other than seeking assistance from the host, the city reserves the right to disable the individual's access to the chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share the screens during the meeting. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Veronica. Second on our agenda for tonight is the approval of the minutes from our past meeting. I didn't have any comments. Uh, Ryan, Becky, have anything? Okay. Yeah. Entertain a motion to approve them as is. Move to um, approve the minutes. <laughs> Give it to Becky if you want. I second. <laughs> All those in excuse me. Does Meredith have something? I'm sorry, Alex. I don't think that Becky can put on because she wasn't in attendance. So okay. Can we oh. give her? Oh, do we need to hold off on this until we have a quorum? Mm -hmm. Of attendees, I believe that's correct. Okay. So maybe we can come back to this when we have a fourth member in attendance. Yeah, that's my understanding. Thank okay. You. Because of that, we'll move on to agenda item number three, which is public comment. Any member of the public wishing to address the board about a transportation matter that is not a public hearing tonight will have up to three minutes to do so. Tonight, we'll have a public hearing on the capital improvement program and the East Aurora neighborhood parking permit expansion. So if you're here to talk about either of those items, there will be a more appropriate time to address the board later. Anyone interested in speaking, please use the raise hand tool within the Zoom platform and our technical host can call on you. Not seeing, oh. Uh, we have one, Brandy, I'm gonna ask, you to unmute yourself, please let me know if you are able to. Can you guys hear me? Yes, perfect. You may okay, begin. I, this is my uh, very first meeting, so I just want to know how to um, sign up for public comment um, on the NPP. And what, what I know you said that we there may be a more appropriate time later, but I'm used to doing these in person where I can see you and get some feedback and that's not the case right now. So I just want to make sure that um, I, I know. Yeah, so when, we, when we get to agenda item five, there'll be a staff presentation. And after the staff presentation, we'll open up the floor for public comment. Uh, and we'll make a similar announcement about raising your, your hand to speak then. Okay, so there's not a list or those kind of type things that if I, I've just been to these meetings and there's been a lot of people wanting to talk and um, I 
yeah, want to make sure that everybody has time and or that, yeah, we've got a list going. Yeah, there there won't be a, a list. It'll just be when we when we get to that, it's a little different than a, a city council meeting, but uh, welcome and we'll look forward to hearing from you when we get to, to that topic. Thank you. All right. If anyone else would like to speak, please use the raise hand function. All right, Lynn, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Please confirm you're able to do so. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I was just um, this week testifying regarding the um, Kanemoto development towards Longmont. And it was kind of interesting because it appears there's some confusion um, Two of the testifiers, one speaking diametrically opposed to each other, both came from this group called Prosper. Um, I think it's called Prosper Longmont. Um, and the co-chair and co-founder of it was one of the people that testified. And, and he was testifying against this development. It's a conservation easement vacation request um for a 40 430 some unit um 40 acre space near airport road on the diagonal near the diagonal and um he it was interesting because he brought up the fact that um the the cost of Tra traversing to your job, commuting to your job was one of their main issues. And the other person that spoke for the development used from the same, you know, um, Prosper Longmont used the same argument for the development. So, you know, housing is is a really confusing situation when it comes to transportation and how and and impacts of climate change and impacts from um you know all of the things that are costly about um main, maintenance and operation and and of roadways and stuff so it's it, what disturbed me about watching this development as it proceeds to hopefully the 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 conservation easement will be vacated but what's disturbing is to see that now it's not just boulder it's longmont and after it's longmont it's going to push the growth out of longmont and it pretty soon detroit is going to be you know expensive housing so growth is what's impacting the whole situation. And that's what I'm always bringing up at the Transportation Advisory Board to please have some say about just growth for the sake of growth, because Thanks, it's Lynn. not helping your situation. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. All right, it does not look like anyone else has their hand raised, Alex. Okay, I don't see Trini on the call. Oh, it does look like Trini's on the call. Oh, she's here. Okay, Trini, are you here? Let's see. Oh, yeah. Trini, if you're yeah, I here, we need it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, welcome. Uh, we skipped over approval of the minutes because we need three of us who were at the last meeting. And since Becky was absent at the last one, um, now that you and Ryan are here, we have uh, enough to, to approve the minutes. Um, did you have any edits to those no. minutes as they were? Okay. No. I think Ryan had moved that we approve the minutes as is, and I seconded that. And so 
We'll do a vote now. All those in favor passes with three affirmative votes and Becky abstaining. Thanks, Meredith. Which brings us to agenda item four, which is a public hearing on the 2023 to 2029 capital improvement program being a public hearing. Uh, there will be an opportunity for any members of the public interested in speaking about the matter to do so to address the board after we hear a staff presentation first. So I'll turn it over to Garrett. Good evening. Good to be with you for the third of three monthly presentations on the Capital Improvement Program. I am joined with you this evening by Lindsay Mers and James Smith, who are both principal project managers in the Capital Projects Division of the Transportation and Mobility Department. And myself, I am a civil engineering senior manager with the Transportation and Mobility Department. So we're here to uh, revisit the items that were presented to you last month. So not a lot has changed from what we presented to you. So we will not go into the same level of detail as we did last month, but uh, provide a reminder of the programs and projects that are included in the 24 to 29 CIP. And with that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, I wanna make sure you, you are actually seeing the slideshow here, correct? Yes. Okay, good. So the, uh, the, the, the CIP is the way that we invest, make investments in our transportation master plan. And those investments are consistent with the ranking of the hierarchy where we want to make sure that we are taking care of our system and that we're prioritizing vision zero, travel safety and system operations as top priorities. And then we have the subsequent other priorities that are outlined in your memo and on this slide. The next slide here talks about our consistency with the sustainability, equity, and resiliency framework. And I will say that you will continue to see more about the way our investment programs, as well as our capital improvement program projects are tied to the sustainability and equity framework through the use of a tool that the city has adopted recently uh, starting last year called OpenGov and did I do that? Are, are we good to keep going? Okay. All right. So you will continue to see the ways that the CIP is connected to the SARE framework and outlined in the OpenGov reports that will be shared with the public here in the coming weeks. So our 24 to 29 CIP represents an approximately $100 million investment with $17 million in grants. And hopefully that number will grow over the next year or so as we await announcements of pending grant applications. And 24 to 25, we are looking at an average of $20 million per year with that number dropping off because of the, the, the recent Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program grants and our annual capital maintenance and mobility programs comprise about $8.5 million per year over the course of this CIP. Of course, most of our funding comes through sales tax, so that's subject to how the economy is doing. And we also do everything we can to supplement that with grant funds, which we've highlighted in the past. So uh, we're using our local dollars to make uh, 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 to turn our pennies and our quarters into full dollars by allowing us to be competitive with pursuing and receiving grant funds through the Dr. Cog TIP program, the Highway Safety Improvement or HSIP program, Transportation Alternative Programs or TAP, and Safe Routes to School, all of which we've been successful in obtaining funding over the last uh, uh, calendar year. We have also, uh, and we'll have an update for you on this later this evening, just submitted an application for Safe Streets for All and are continuing to keep our eyes open for other opportunities such as reconnecting communities and smart grants. The challenge that we're facing, of course, is the reducing power of our dollar given the inflationary market pressures, <laughs> excuse me, particularly in the construction marketplace, which you've seen in this slide over the, the last couple of meetings. So 
our investment program is proposed to be balanced over the course of this CIP about 50-50 between projects and programs. And the uh, notable changes that uh, you've seen and what we're proposing is increases to be able to make enhancements to the, uh, to the confluence path area. And so we're looking for an increase one time in 2024 for allowing construction of the Valmont multi-use path. Additional funding for 19th Street, additional funding for the East Arapahoe 47th sidewalk in downtown Boulder Station, and an increase to the TIP TMP line item and removal of deficient street light replacement because of that now being an effort of the, the city to take over the purchase of all the Excel street lights. So that will be an item that's covered elsewhere in the, the city budget for the future. So you've seen this slide previously as well that talks about each of the capital programs. James is going to touch on those again here in a moment. These are the annual ways that we preserve the integrity and the assets that we've made significant investments in over the years and are focused on taking care of these vital assets that are used by all modes of travel, travel throughout the community. And then we have the individual projects, which were also I outlined and included in, in your memo, including the new projects that uh, were recently awarded as part of the 22 to 25, as well as the 24 to 27 TIP awards. And the safe routes and the TAP project are also included in this summary. The Transportation Development Fund also provides funding for us to be able to coordinate when we have capital improvement project, projects that are adjacent to development, as well as make investments in signals where they are warranted, and also has an item for providing local match for TIP projects, as well as TMP implementation. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to James to provide a recap of the capital maintenance programs. Thanks, Garrett. Uh Hello, Tech. Uh, thanks for having us again. Um, the following slides will briefly describe the various CIP uh, capital asset maintenance programs. So first up is our payment management program, or PMP. Uh, the PMP prioritizes the safety and preservation of the transportation system by maintaining the approximately 300 mile street system here in Boulder. This includes inspecting and rating all streets on a three year interval to maintain awareness of existing conditions which guide where payment rehabilitation products will be focused in future years. Um, the PMP is identified as a priority one or high priority. And um, we use the uh, PCI score to, to help guide and prioritize our work. Our work. Um, and then the PMP also works to leverage the proposed improvements identified through the efforts of Vision Zero and core arterial network planning. To do this, the Mobility Enhancements Initiative, which is part of the payment management program, incorporates bicycle and pedestrian facility improvements into annual payment resurfacing work to help make our streets safer for walking and biking. Uh, next slide. Uh, next up are the pedestrian focus programs. These programs include the pedestrian facilities enhancements program, the pedestrian facilities repair and replacement program, and the sidewalk maintenance program. These programs are 100% dedicated to pedestrian movement. The sidewalk maintenance budget funds the miscellaneous sidewalk repair program. Sidewalk repairs under this program are identified through citizen reports throughout the entire city. The pedestrian facilities repair, replacement, and ADA improvements budget funds the annual sidewalk repair program. This program focuses on a specific area of the city where repair needs are identified by our staff and then shared with adjacent property owners. The costs are shared with the adjacent property owners. Uh, next is the pedestrian facility enhancements budget. It's an ongoing funding program that includes the installation of missing sidewalk links and pedestrian crossing safety and treatments. Uh, these programs are identified in the, in the TMT as priority one as well, and the various implementation locations are prioritized each year using condition level and program guidance documents. And then next slide. 
Uh, next are the multi-use path programs. These include the multi-use path enhancement budget and the multi-use path capital maintenance budget. These programs are dedicated to enhancing and maintaining the current 80 plus miles of path within the city to meet the needs for pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, these, these are also priority one um, investments or high priority. Uh, and then lastly, the last slide, I think. Lastly is the capital reconstruction program is used largely to fund the bridge asset management program and provides funding to repair existing major and minor structure bridge assets that are close to or at the end of their useful life. This funding provides the ability to complete the capital repairs that are not typically eligible for grant funding. Uh, this is also a priority one investment. And then the multi, I'm sorry, the, uh, this program is identified in the TMP, I apologize. The bridge health index is used to prioritize this work. The bridge health index is a bridge performance measure to rate the overall health of the structure and is rated between one and 10. And I think with that, that's all the programs that we have. So moving on to the next item in the CIP, is the TIP local match and TMP implementation, which is reflected on the project side of the, the table. And we are proposing to increase that. Historically, we have been around the $3 million level, and we're proposing to increase that to the $4 million level so that we are able to continue to be competitive in the, to the future and being strategically positioned to pursue grant opportunities as they come forward to us. And so examples of that would be Safe Streets for All, the SMART grants, and we are also a minor partner in the PROTECT grant for which right now we are not being asked to provide any funding. But if we decide to participate and add additional enhancements to that project, we would be asked to provide funding, um, such as making better bike and pedestrian improvements as part of that project. And so we would want to have that funding available to us. And so the other aspect of this is being able to uh, keep up with the level of matching we've provided in the past with inflation being where it's at. This will continue to provide a competitive advantage to the city and being successful in pursuing grants. So I'm now going to hand it off to Lindsay to talk about some of the specific projects that were introduced to you last month. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, so as Garrett mentioned, I'm going to just do a quick refresher on some of the CIP projects that are being proposed to be funded in 2024. So first is the baseline road project, which is focused on making baseline road from 28th Street to Foothills Parkway safer, more comfortable, more connected, um, really for, for any type of mode that users choose to travel. So this project has two phases. Construction of phase one of the project started in June, so about a month ago. And then in 2024, the city will develop and design for further improvements um, in phase two. And the phase two portion of the project includes constructing additional bike lane protection, intersection and pedestrian crossing improvements, transit efficiency, uh, and safety improvements, such as floating bus islands, and converting some of the phase one improvements into more permanent features. And construction of phase two is estimated to begin in 2025. Next one, Garrett. So this is the 30th Street project. This project is from Arapaho Avenue to the Diagonal Highway. And it proposes to complete preliminary design for protected bike facilities and transit stop improvements. Um, the project will develop and evaluate conceptual transportation design options to improve multimodal travel along 30th Street, and it will include the preliminary engineering and then all of the cost estimates for the transportation improvements. Um, the preliminary engineering plans will provide facilities for users of all ages and ability, and it will help meet the city's Vision Zero goal of eliminating fatal and serious injury collisions as well as improve the travel conditions for transit users, pedestrians, and bicyclists. 
by addressing travel comfort and security. And so this is a continuation of the 30th Street Corridor Study, which was completed in 2016 and 2017. And the safe routes or the safe streets and roads for all are the SS4A grant for implementation that was just submitted a few days ago um, will uh, be addressed for this project. Next project, Garrett. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Broadway Bat Lanes project. So this will include design and construction of intersection improvements to provide some transit priority at two intersections at Broadway and Table Mesa, and then Broadway and Regent. There's also a component where we're going to provide analysis of converting the general purpose travel lane um, along Broadway between Table Mesa and 18th to the business access transit or the bat lanes um, by using lane restriping and signage. However, the funding for this is just for the intersections, which will then provide the width needed to complete the future lane conversions. And so construction of the intersections is planned to re begin in 2025. Next one, Garrett. And the Manhattan Safe Streets uh, to School Project will provide improved pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure to increase safety and provide convenient travel options, and then encourage just the active lifestyles in the neighborhood. The project is moving into final design and construction is planned to take place in 2025. Next one, Garrett. So the East Arapahoe uh, final design from 28th Street to Foothills Parkway will implement better facilities for walking, biking, and transit consistent with the East Arapahoe transportation plan. So this is a TIP and CDOT funded project, and it's going to take the approximately 15% level design scheduled to be completed later this year and advance it into final design by the end of 2024. And so CDOT is project manager for all of the preliminary design, but the city of Boulder will be the project manager for the final design. Next one, Garrett. So some additional CIP projects with TIP grants uh, that will actually start in 2025, includes the Folsom Street, Pine to Colorado corridor study and preliminary design, the 30th Street design and construction between Colorado and Aurora, and the West Colorado Regent to Folsom project, which was added to a wait list for grant funding. And we are anticipating to receive word on if we received partial or full funding sometime in 2024. Okay. And so then there are also several projects that are currently being funded by the Community Culture Safety and Resilience Fund. And so these include the replacement of the Central Ave Bridge, the corroded signal pole replacement, the short term pavement management program funding boost, purchasing of the Excel streetlights, some supplemental funding for 28th in Colorado, and supplemental funding for 30th Street multimodal improvements, and then a project on Violet Avenue for a bridge, um, for, bridge for a park, and then for improvements on Four Mile Canyon Creek. All right, so our next steps are to take this information to planning board along with all of the other departments in the city for their review and input. And then this will also go to city council in September and October for their review and consideration and approval. And as Alex noted, this is a public hearing. So we are looking for a recommendation of the 24 to 29 CIP to planning board as a part of this agenda item this evening. And at this point, we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Garrett. And welcome back, James and Lindsay. Uh, Tab, now's the time for clarifying questions. We'll have more time to provide feedback and talk about a potential motion after we hear from the public on this one. Does anyone have any questions before we get to that? Ryan? I think I have a question or two. Um, Garrett, Lindsay, and Dean, thanks so much. Uh, this is very clear um, in the details. I have a big picture question. Um, and I'm just, and my understanding is this is a major um, portion of the transportation department's overall budget. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can 
uh, confirm that or or maybe um, correct it, correct my thinking regarding that, that this is sort of like the, one of the biggest pieces and maybe specifically say like just big picture how, what what percentage of the overall transportation budget is this is the CIP project or program and 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 then like what are the other big pieces of budget just just give a sense of context please thank you. Yes, so I'm going to ask Natalie to chime in on this. I do have uh, some recent experience working on the pre preparation of our department-wide budgets. And um, I think that historically, the CIP has represented probably, um, depending on year to year, anywhere from 25 to 35% of the overall budget. I think the next two years or an anomaly 24 and 25 and that we have some pretty substantial projects coming forward that are boosting it to a, a higher ratio to where it might be approximately 40 percent of the overall but uh um and also i, th I think we've got uh, gastonia here but uh as our budget analyst uh, to be able to speak to the, the ratio uh, of the overall budget but i made a reference earlier ryan to open gov which is a, a finance and government uh, uh a trans or sorry, excuse me a transparency and government finance tool that the city is using and there are a number of charts and graphs and tables that you'll be able to explore to get a sense of our overall budget here fairly soon when that is shared with the public so um natalie feel free to jump in here yeah i'll just confirm it historically has been i think in that like 25 percent ish um place of the overall budget at least if we're speaking i think around the transportation fund um and but as Garrett said, kind of over the next couple of years, we're seeing the CIP probably be on a bigger percentage. It might be 40 percent. I haven't really looked at it closely, but um, and that's because of, as we've talked about, a lot of grant funding that's coming in over the next couple of years. Um, we have a we have a big CIP the next couple of years, which is exciting. Um, and it's also a lot <laughs> for us to to be doing so okay got it uh and and that's great news and understand that's also a lot yeah like but the don thing maybe in some respects can you just say then um so the, a quarter to a third ish or something of the overall budget that's what this is that council sees are there other main budget items or, or proposals that will go to council besides cip just insofar as that providing perspective to you know for the proposal of council what else will they see that's a budget, like a big budget item or, big, or budget proposal? They're so I can, there. yeah, so I can speak um, kind of generally about our 2024 budget request and we can come back to council or back to tab um, uh, at a future evening to provide a summary of kind of what our 2024 budget request was. Um, but we really, the, the, main focus of our 2024 budget request is to continue to provide the level of service that we provide today with the increasing cost to provide that level of service. So um, we're seeing, you know, I would say rounding big numbers about a 2 million-ish increase over 2023, and Garrett can correct my math on that. Um, but that's really just to continue to provide the level of service from an operation and maintenance standpoint of our system that we're providing today and at a, you know, at a big increase in cost to do that. We did have some other enhancement adjustments that we needed to make um, a couple personnel requests um, to support just ongoing needs. You know, you saw over the next couple of years, we have a lot of design and construction projects on our plates and we're going to need some additional personnel to help with that work so um that that's our request nothing's been approved yet but we can certainly come back to tab at a future night to give okay. um, a more detailed kind of summary of what our request was okay so the picture i'm getting just to understand the the context of the of how this budget fits in the over budget that council you'll ask for council feedback on there's the overall budget that's not today that's that's the overall budget for another day then there's a cip budget Council will see both of those. There's not other major chunks. This is sort of the biggest um, single item that council will see for transportation outside of the overall budget request. That's correct. Great, okay. Um, 
Thanks. And, to, and to, to clarify, Ryan, the reason that we come to TAB for input and recommendation on the capital improvement program specifically and not the overall operating budget is it's in your charter and the, the Boulder Revised Code that it's in your purview to review and recommend the capital improvement program. And that's not unique to transportation. Every other department in the city that has a board is asked to do the same. So the Parks and Recreation, Recreation Advisory Board, the, the RAB for utilities, OSBT for open space, they are all conducting similar reviews of the CIP, which are recommended to, to planning board. Planning board also does not get direct uh, approval on the operating budget. That is only through city council. Got it. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll say the rest for comments. Uh, that helps me to, to, yeah, sort of put my thoughts together. Thanks very much. I have one question. When this goes to council, does this go as a presentation similar to the one we received tonight, or is it mostly in their packet along with the other budgets? That's correct. It will go in as a packet. So council will see a very high level presentation that describes key operational enhancements as well as key capital improvement investments, but they will not get this level of detail in their uh, in the presentation. Within the, uh, the 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 content of the memo, they should see very similar type of information as what was in your packet. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from Tab? Not seeing any, we'll go ahead and open this up for the public hearing. Any member of the public wishing to talk about this item, please use the raise hand tool and our technical host will call on you and you'll have three up to three minutes to address the board. All right, it looks like Thomas has had his hand up. So Thomas, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, please confirm you're able to do so. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes, you may begin. Uh, is, is, where there's uh, t -t 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 our two of us here. Um, we're here for the 31st to 38th Street parking. Is that going to be on the agenda? Yeah, that's our fifth agenda item. This is the fourth one. Uh, so after we conclude this public hearing, we'll move on to that one. And then that would be the appropriate time to address the board about. OK, great. Uh, Thank you. The East Aurora neighborhood parking permit expansion cool then i'll call on someone else um alexi i'm going to ask you to unmute please confirm you're able to do so good this is alexi davies i guess yes. i have a common request on automatic speed enforcement i know after it goes to council a resolution going to council probably in the fall i heard um is there going to be a purchase of cameras and installation of those cameras? And would that be part of SIP? I think it's very important to tie it into Vision Zero. I mean, that should be a high priority. So more of a question, probably too late to throw it in the bucket now. Thanks, Alexi. The staff have an answer on that one that they'd like to provide at this time. So the speed camera enforcement is not part of the capital improvement program for transportation and mobility that is part of an operational budget and I see Devin has turned on his camera so he might be able to speak more directly about the the way that's funded yeah Alexi um good evening everyone my name is Devin Jaws and I'm the principal traffic engineer for the city Alexi in response to your question we've been working very closely with the police department and my understanding is the police department is doing some planning and adding in some items for their 2024 budget um, to help with expansion of the photo speed enforcement program. All right, we'll move on to the next question. David has their hand up. Uh, I'm gonna ask to unmute. Please confirm you're able to do so. Uh, I Yeah, I believe I am. Uh, just a quick, a quick clarification, and this might just a quick clarification. Um, it might be too far off for for that, but uh, I would love to hear more of uh, in regard to the supplemental funding for the 30th Street multi uh, multimodal improvements. I was just 
kind of wondering uh, what what improvements were being planned in in specific. So I think we made reference in our presentation to two different segments of 30th Street. There was a segment from Arapaho to Iris or the Diagonal Highway, which is a corridor study and preliminary design. And so the outcome of that will be based on a, a pretty robust community engagement effort and consulting with stakeholders affected along the corridor. And so it's uh, too early to know what will come of that effort, but uh, the desire is to bring forward recommendations for the corridor that make it easy for people to travel along and across the 30th Street corridor on that segment. And then the other section of 30th Street that is funded for design and construction is between Colorado and Aurora, uh, which would connect to the intersection currently wrapping up construction and put in place better bike lane and pedestrian facilities in that section from Colorado to Aurora, consistent with the recommendations of the 30th and Colorado corridor study. All right, uh, it doesn't look like anyone else has their hand up, Alex, so you may continue. Okay, thank you. Sorry, my wife, I cut out there for a second. And did, did you mention the third project that's nearing construction north of the underpass up to Arapaho? Yes, that project is also, um, it was not mentioned this evening as part of the CIP presentation, but it is imminent and uh, we're looking for that one to start construction this year, uh, which no. will connect the, the, under, the intersection at Colorado to just south of Arapaho. Then to David's question, that'll include the same number of travel lanes, some back of curb protected bike lanes, sidewalk and transit stop enhancements, and potentially crossing enhancements to make it safer to get across the street. Um, and then the city's also secured funding to do preliminary design north of Arapaho that might take some of those features and extend them all the way up to the, the diagonal. Correct. Seeing no more, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Thanks to everyone who joined us with questions. Uh, uh, and Alex, sorry, I just yeah. saw another hand go up, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. So this is interesting. You can ask questions rather than just ha give a statement about the hearing. If chat, the staff chooses to respond to questions, that's their prerogative, but generally okay. these are opportunities for people to provide feedback that's for the board's consideration as we do our deliberation and recommendation to council. That's great. I just haven't noticed that being part of protocol before. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, um, well, Natalie says, yeah, we have all these CIP funds um, and that's great, but um, I kind of think of them in the way that I think of LIHTC funds for housing. Um, you get a lot of grants and you get them probably because there's matching funds and federal grants or state grants or what have you. And they're, they're at the same time that they're offered to the city, then they're also promoting a lot more growth. And from my perspective of riding my bike, I only drive my car once every six months or so. I just don't like to go east. And I live at 6th and Dewey. I don't like to go east in Boulder at all because it just adds so much time to um, wherever I'm going um, in stoplights. And, and um, so the more, the more you're getting these funds and, and, putting them through and improving, doing traffic improvements. You're also, um, you know, paving the way for just more growth. And, and that's the sad thing about, you know, that it, that's the bad side of getting all this funding done. Thank you for joining us again, Lynn. Uh, it That's looks right. like there's no one else. Okay. We'll open up 
for tab feedback and an eventual recommendation for planning board and council. Trini? Well, I am just really grateful for all this work that you guys have done. I've, I've seen um, some of the grant work that has grant been. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what that was. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to say thank you and, you know, just addressing um, how this is going to negatively impact. I don't see any negative impact. I was a user of East Boulder roads when my child went to Manhattan Middle School and I personally experienced how much of my time I had to invest because I had to find alternative routes. So these improvements, I think, will benefit a lot of people they'll save a lot of lives and i'm just incredibly grateful for all your work so thank you ryan or becky ryan i uh second trini on the um the incredible work that staff has done and is doing to both put this kind of a budget together and prepare for and staff up to, to do the work ahead. Uh, I really appreciate the diligence of the study here itself and what's gone into it. Um, and I have feedback, but it's the feedback is really just about how you label the package that is going to city council. And so if I, if you bear with me to just maybe review a couple of points and then, and then I'll, I'll make my, uh, my, my conclusion. Um, so this is the most important large item of, of detailed budget for transportation that gets a real look from the public and from city council. It's also really one of the largest chunks of the overall budget, um, around a quarter or a third or something like that, and it you know, goes up and down. Um, and it's also about capital projects, which is something that is um, specified in city code to have public review across departments. Um, and it's so important in part because it's about effectively about the physical system that we are building for the city of Boulder going forward. And um, the picture is not great from a, from a financial perspective uh, as the memo reads. So sales, because I'll just read it, so because sales tax funds nearly 70% of transportation and because construction cost indexes have been outpacing inflation rate, this has led to reduced spending power and reduced opportunities for matched federal and state grant funds. And as uh, I heard um, just commented verbally a few moments ago, um, we have about a 2 million increase over 2023 just to maintain uh, the same level of services. Uh, so I think the study here or the, the proposal does a really good mechanical analysis of what's happening, but it's pretty muted. And I'm not looking at the actual memo to council, so maybe this will be maybe this is not um, a critique of what's coming to tab. But what I would propose consider uh, highlighting when this does go to council is that um, what I don't see in here is much on the the financial situation that gives a uh, a set of choices to council about what's really before them um, for a city that has ambitious TMP goals, climate goals, and other goals. And I guess I would summarize it as something like, we are doing an incredible amount with funding. Um, and the funding we have, that we are given, that we have you know, been authorized to pursue and have time to pursue, is a limiting factor for Boulder, the city of Boulder, delivering the greatest possible livability for residents and visitors. Transportation is core to climate action and equity and other goals that are of great consequence for the city. And we could be doing more with more money, um, more money that staff is not, you know, doesn't have, uh, the staff doesn't have. And um, not to mention that we still don't even have transit back up to where it was in uh, 2019 level. And um, these are things that are not on the staff to figure out, but I do think that in a discussion for council about the most strategic elements of 
budgeting for transportation, this should be on their desk very clearly um, and written as a set of choices. And the choices are something like <laughs> keep going, business as usual, or you know, council, um, be aware that we are limited with funds we have, and there's you know, there could be conversations about how to how to do more um, from presumably from your from your standpoint through kinds of things city council could could do could work on could help with. I don't know how you would put that exactly from a staff perspective, um, but I think that uh, some way to to label this to council with the strategic significance that the council really has a choice here. Not just to not just to say, will you please approve it? But the council has a choice to say, if you really want to crank on a multimodal, completely walkable, bikeable, transit-rich center or city city, um, that you know there there are options that that you council could do work on. So um, I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you for your work. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I view this having seen how this has evolved over the past five years to me. I mean, this is exciting. It doesn't feel like business as usual. I feel like when I got onto the board, a lot of the projects were small in reach and extravagant in price, and we were missing some of the low cost opportunities. And this does a really good job of spreading the money that we do have uh, to impact as many trips as possible and, and address our most pressing needs. And so to me, this feels far more scalable than any budget I've seen in previous years and hopefully something that will inspire some confidence and additional support from council. I think the presentation that we saw did a good job of highlighting the connections between the projects that are coming up in the core arterial network, hearing that the interface with council is going to be pretty limited. I think one thing that would be informative would be a map that shows how these projects directly interact with the core arterial network. So highlighting segments or intersections that have been completed, if there are any things that are funded already or in construction, and then what this budget accomplishes. And I think it'll show an immense amount of work and progress that's been made in just a year and a half, but it'll also highlight the gaps that are forming for things that aren't funded. And that might help make the case to scale this operation being funded oh we lost you for a Did minute there out? alex yeah okay looked like it sorry i'm having internet issues i it, said i'm excited we just about lost this you. And... yeah at the um at the part where you said where it's like scalable i think and then okay yeah i think this is scalable and should inspire confidence and uh and council to provide additional funding did you hear me when i was talking about a map mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so I'm ready to support this this evening, and it is exciting to see a lot of things that this board has been involved with in the past, from the pavement management program to the core arterial network to some of the tip projects that we've brought forward, uh, be formally formally incorporated into the into the city budget. Alex, can I'm, I just say I agree? Oh, sorry, I forgot to, I don't know if I clarified that in my remarks. Yeah, totally support, ready to ready to endorse this. Awesome. Becky, any comments? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, uh, no, no, I'll just, yeah, thank, uh, I'll just echo kind of thanks to everyone for all the work that went into this. And um, I also uh, agree, I'm supportive of uh, what's been forth. Garrett, do you want to pull up the motion language if you have that handy? And if anyone would like to make a motion, please do so. Move to approve. I second. Approve what? <laughs> Move to approve what, Ryan? <laughs> oh, sorry. Move to approve the item that is called. Yeah, that is called public uh, regarding public hearing and tab recommendation regarding 2023 capital improvement program. Um, we, I move to make uh, 
move to approve uh, the, uh, the, the the department's request. <laughs> I'm sure, if I did that properly, I don't think I did that properly. Um, I second. Okay. okay, let let me let me maybe just try to say it. I I I I move that we approve staff's uh, recommendation uh, for the 2024 to 2029 CIP to planning board. Now that I'm looking at it. Thank you. Any with a second? I second. Any other deliberation? If not, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Seeing four votes passes unanimously. Awesome. Thanks, team. Thank you. I just want to say before you move on to the next item, really appreciate all the feedback and input and your collaboration through this process. It's uh, always enjoyable and appreciate the, the effort this year from all of you. Thanks, and we Garrett. still have a fun bike tour ahead. That's right. <laughs> Good work, Garrett and James and Lindsay. Thank you. No. We lost Alex. Brings us to my back now. Not really. Ryan, you might have to take now? over for Alex. <laughs> or Becky, sorry. <laughs> Becky, you might have to take over for Alex. <laughs> okay. Alex, are you? Can't tell. No. Am I going? Or Alex, are you? Can you hear me? We can now. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to switch networks, so I might cut out again. All right. Looks like I'm okay. So we have a couple of things here. Sorry about that issue. Uh, the residential access management program. This will be a briefing for TAP and for us to provide feedback, as well as a public hearing on the East Aurora neighborhood parking permit expansion, that being a public hearing, it means there will be an opportunity for members of the public wishing to address the board to do so after we've uh, seen the staff presentation. I know we have a few people interested in speaking about this, and thank you for sticking with us as we, as we get to this item. So with that, I'll turn it over to staff for the presentation. Good evening, Tab. Chris Jones here, Director of the Community Vitality Department. We're joined by Sam Bromberg in Community Vitality and Bill Cowern this evening from Fox Tuttle, who's been helping us with some analysis of the East Aurora neighborhood, as well as other elements of the Residential Access Management Program. So without further ado, I think I'm just gonna hand it over to them to begin their presentation. Thanks, Chris. Just gonna share my screen. And can everybody, whoops, see that okay? Yep. All right, thanks for having me here tonight. If you'll recall, Bill Cowan and I attended the March TAB meeting and solicited input on a couple of questions about the continued development of RAMP and the criteria for how we can apply RAMP strategies in the administration of the NPP program. Staff hoped to develop the criteria in order to respond to petition requests for NPPs that meet all key metrics, including the petition to expand the existing East Aurora NPP zone. We are here tonight on two fronts. First, to present the developed criteria, and second, to make a recommendation on a proposal in response to the East Aurora NPP expansion petition in a public hearing. I am joined again by Bill, who will be presenting on the criteria we developed and how we applied it to the East Aurora proposal. For the agenda tonight, first I'll offer some additional background about how we got to this point. I'll then hand it over to Bill to discuss our work to develop the proposal criteria and how we applied it to the East Aurora NPP expansion petition. I'll then review <clears throat> the community engagement results, our staff recommendations, open up the floor for questions, we'll conduct the public hearing and we'll end with a formal motion. I want to offer a quick refresher on how we got here. The Residential Access Management Program was identified in the Access Management and Parking Strategy adopted by Council in 2017. 
This graphic visualizes the key ongoing projects related to AMPS, which includes work to advance updates to the parking code and adoption of a TDM ordinance that could begin as soon as 2024, depending on council priorities. Further exploration of new and expanded residential access management tools will be included as part of those work plan items. The ramp policy was developed after extensive community engagement and approved by council in 2021. The program itself was built out by staff, put through the city's racial equity instrument, and later approved by council in 2022. At that same council meeting in 2022, staff presented the case of the East Aurora NPP expansion petition, which met all criteria for moving to a staff proposal. Council directed staff to move forward with the program and prepare a proposal for the East Aurora NPP expansion petition. It was at this time that staff identified an opportunity to further refine the proposal approach and use the petition to show how the approach could work. This brings us to tonight's presentation. How does RAMP work to meet our citywide sustainability, equity, and resilience framework goals? RAMP addresses the goals of safe, livable, accessible and connected, and responsibly governed. The parking management solutions implemented under RAMP help support the existing transportation system, manage congestion, and allow community members easier access to their homes. It has proven successful at supporting parking management efforts at traffic generating destinations. RAMP's goals are to be more responsive to user behaviors and neighborhood diversity, promote predictability, transparency, and understanding of regulations, generate revenue and achieve cost recovery, advance climate and sustainability goals, and increase the quality of life for everyone, residents and visitors alike. Here we can see all the key metrics for what thresholds need to be met for staff to consider adding a new managed parking zone or adding blocks to an existing managed parking zone. The metrics include parking occupancy, visitation, zoning, barriers to movement, and resident petition. The petitioned area for the East Aurora NPP expansion met all the criteria outlined on my previous slide. And in November, 2022, council directed staff to explore the possibility of expanding the zone. We've reached step four in the process that was initiated by the area meeting all key metrics. I will now turn it over to Bill Cowern of Fox Settle to review how we approach the additional criteria needed to create the proposal using the petitioned East Aurora NPP expansion area as our test case. Next slide, please. Good evening, members of the tab. Um, as Samantha noted, Fox Tuttle has been working with city staff to develop recommendations for additional ramp implementation criteria and to help staff help staff apply the criteria to the current East Aurora expansion proposal. The recommendations for ramp implementation criteria included the public process requirements for non petition blocks and determining regulation of non permit parking, specifically paid parking time restrictions or both. Our approach to making recommendations on these criteria involved the feedback that we received from yourselves at your March 13th meeting. It also included a needs, wants, and considerations assessment from key staff stakeholders. And it included a peer review research that we did with seven uh, US communities. Now there's much more detailed information in our technical memorandum. But in summary, our recommendations for criteria one were that non-petitioning blocks would not have to specifically petition to be included. They would express support or concern through the public process and subsequent tab public hearing. And then for criteria two, um, regarding the regulation of non-permit parking, it was our recommendation that city staff provide specific information to policymakers regarding the following assessment of equitable access through multimodal options and availability of external parking, available white space anticipated for non-permit parking, the type of trip being generated for by trip generating land use, in this case, Williams Village, long-term or short-term parking, and the assessment of walking, uh, biking, uh, trip generation land use, and 
and whether the pay station could be strategically staged if um, pay stations were to be considered a part of the proposal. Next slide, please. So we then applied these new criteria to the East Aurora NPP expansion, which is currently under consideration. Uh, the current East Aurora NPP zones in place on streets north of Aurora, and it was requested in response, primarily in response to students parking in the neighborhood for classes at the CU East campus. The area petitioning for expansion into the, into the zone now are blocks south of Aurora, their concern is primarily students living in Williams Village campus housing and who have long-term parking in their neighborhood streets or on their neighborhood streets. CU does provide space for long-term storage of student vehicles, but the students have to pay a fee. They have to buy a permit, approximately $235 a semester to have that permit, and that would allow them to park in that lot. And consequently, some students park for free in the East Aurora neighborhood. The residents living on those blocks submitted a petition per NPP regulations to expand the East Aurora NPP to include their blocks in July of 2020. Next slide, please. So this is a photograph of um, 31st Street. You can see Williams Village in the background. It just shows um, the extent to which uh, the street is parked up Next slide, please. This is a little bit further north um, over by Arrowwood Park. Again, 100% uh, parking utilization. Next slide, please. And again, this is 32nd Street, one block over. You can see Williams Village in the background. And again, the street is um, experiencing very high parking utilization. Next slide, please. So this graphic shows the study area. The existing zone is noted in red. Um, the blocks petitioning for expansion into the zone are noted in green. There's also several streets that were not a part of the petition, which may be impacted by the expansion and are being studied as well. And these are the ones that are noted in blue. Next slide. So the following are the evaluation components used to determine whether an NPP expansion should be placed in the study area, and if so, how the non-permit parking should be managed. Again, hourly restrictions, paid parking, or both. We first looked at uh, determining the parking utilization on the residential streets. We also sought to document um, the extent to which non-resident parking was associated on those streets. We uh, determine the availability of alternative parking and other multimodal service for non-resident users. This is the TDM plan that's referenced in the NPP regulations. We evaluated the expected resident permit parking density. This is particularly helpful in determining whether it would be appropriate for uh, paid parking management and then confirming whether paid parking infrastructure could be considered as a part of this zone. Next slide, please. So parking utilization is the first thing that we evaluated. The city's neighborhood permit parking zone regulations suggest that blocks should be considered for new zones or expansions if evaluations show that there's at least three instances where the block or block face has 60% or greater parking utilization. Each of the block faces within the study zone were evaluated multiple times. The blocks which did have 60% utilization or greater on at least three different Evaluation attempts are noted with the solid lines. Those that did not are noted with the dashed lines. The greatest level of parking appears to be on the Western blocks, 31st Street through 35th Street. And then Aurora Air Avenue also has several blocks with high utilization. You'll probably note that the block of Madison Avenue and the block of 35th Street south of Colorado, they also have very high parking utilization. However, the land use on those roadways is high density residential and therefore these streets are precluded from the program. Next slide, please. So the NPP is not a great tool for mitigating parking impacts that are generated solely by people living in the neighborhood. Therefore, the NPP regulation suggests that at least 25% of the vehicles parked 
should be owned by people living outside of the neighborhood. City staff has traditionally looked at vehicles parking during the day and overnight to try and draw conclusions about non-resident parking. However, this method is less reliable now. We have more people that are working from home and it's especially challenging when the non-resident parking is long-term parking rather than like a class or a commute type parking. So it's difficult to determine whether a person parked both day and night is a person working from home or a student parking long-term, for example. Therefore, we supplemented our analysis with a review of parking utilization both during the school year and during summer break when most of the students wouldn't be in town. That analysis showed that there would be a demonstrable increase in parking utilization during the school year compared to summer break. For example, on 32nd Street, directly across from Williams Village, the street had over 60% parking utilization, quite a bit over 60%, 79% of the time that it was studied during the school year, and it never exceeded 60% during the summer break. So when you consider that coupled with the high parking utilization, the number of homes and how parking looks on other streets, it seems apparent that there is a considerable amount of non-resident parking on at least some of these streets. Next slide, please. So the city's NPP regulations also note that a TDM evaluation should be performed for new or expanded zones to determine the availability of on-site parking and multimodal options for people who are currently parking in the study area and who would not be eligible for permits. For the East Aurora expansion, nearby transit service and facilities for walking and biking to key city destinations were considered a part of this evaluation. In addition, the availability of long-term on-site parking at Williams Village campus was considered. The evaluation showed that there was good transit service, excellent bicycle facilities, and a network of multi-use paths all of which connect this area to key city destinations. CU students also have access to eco passes and a B cycle membership. As a result, uh, the transit, pedestrian, and bicycle real estate scores um, for this area were, uh, they're shown in the slide 51, 76, and 100, respectively. There is, again, long term parking available in lot 622 of William Village. Um, this is, comes at a cost of $235 approximately per semester. These results suggest that there wouldn't be an equity issue implementing an MPP extension, expansion, nor would there be an issue if paid parking were used to manage the non permit parking in the zone. However, the availability of long term parking at Williams Village. Williams Village Plus, uh, the fact that the parking is long term rather than short term, both suggest that um, using paid parking would probably be of limited value at this in this expansion. Next slide, please. So the density of housing and specifically the likely density of resident permit vehicles on street are factors in determining whether paid parking would be appropriate for a new or an expanded zone. Staff undertook a comparison of the number of residents within uh, different existing zones and the number of resident NPP permits obtained in those zones to determine how many permits each residence was likely, would be likely to obtain for any new or expanded zone. This evaluation showed that there was an average of one permit per two households or uh, 0 0.5 permits per household averaging across the current program. This value aligned particularly well with the data specific to the existing East Aurora NPP, which is the closest one. Next slide, please. Staff then reviewed the parking capacity and the number of households for key blocks within the study area. A determination was made about how much of the white space would likely be occupied by resident permit parking. The values for these blocks were fairly low, generally less than about 20%. This suggests that resident permit parking would not fill a large portion of the white space and there would be space available for non-permit parking to occur. Depending on the type of parking valued in the study area, this could mean that a paid parking approach for non-permit parking might be appropriate. Again, in this case, since the desired parking is long-term and there would be a less expensive option at Williams Village, it's not likely that paid parking would be the appropriate tool. Next slide, please. 
And so that brings us to our conclusions. Um, the blocks between 35th, uh, 31st and 35th are highly parked up with a significant number of vehicles belonging to people who don't reside in the study area. The blocks between 36th and 39th, as well as um, portions of Aurora, are close enough that they would likely see spillover parking if they were included, not included in the NPP. There are multimodal transportation options for non-residents currently parking in the area. This would support a paid parking approach um, if it were to be included. Anticipated resident permit parking density is low enough to support a paid parking approach. But the type of trip that it, type of non-resident trip that seems to be common here and the presence of that on-site parking at Williams Village, um, that does not support the paid parking approach for this zone. Next slide, please. So this graphic shows the expansion proposal, which was sent to the neighborhood for review. It includes all the block faces, which were, which were part of the original petition in blue. Blocks on 39th Street and Aurora in yellow, which we thought should also be included because they either have a high utilization today or because we would expect the new expansion to push parking onto those streets. This is the proposal which residents reviewed and responded to. And with that, I'll pass this presentation back over to Samantha to talk about that public process. Thanks, Bill. To solicit feedback from community members in the East Aurora area, staff mailed out a postcard and later a letter with details of the proposal and a link to an online questionnaire. The materials were sent out to all residents, owners, and businesses in the proposal area, as well as surrounding blocks. All responses to the proposal were included in the packet. After analyzing the responses, staff found that although the proposal was created in response to a resident-driven petition, most respondents were in opposition to the expansion of the MPP. Staff received a total of 228 responses to the proposal with comments on 194 of the responses. Of those who were opposed to the proposal and left comments, 70 respondents cite cost of permits, 31 cite no perceived need for parking management, and 20 disapprove of the specific structure of the program. Those who mentioned the cost of the permits, for context, the cost is $40 per year for a residential permit in 2023 bring up the high cost of living in Boulder, the recent increase in property taxes, and many express frustration that residents should have to pay for a permit at all. Respondents who cited no perceived need for parking management stated that parking was not an issue on their block. Finally, those who disapproved of the structure of the program mentioned that the proposal would create parking impacts on nearby streets and that there are not enough permits being offered per, per household. This was clarified in the FAQs, but many people mentioned in the comments that only two permits could be purchased per household when it is, in fact, two permits per resident. Another common theme across both those in opposition and those in support is the idea that CU should be responsible for, or at least aiding in, resolving the parking issues. Comments in support of the proposal include safety concerns due to poor visibility with current parking congestion, difficulty of parking near one's home, and many suggest that the restrictions could extend beyond what was proposed, particularly overnight restrictions. Interestingly, the support for the proposal was higher, coming in at 44%, on the blocks that did not petition but were included in the proposed expansion boundaries. Staff have identified four possible options to respond to the petition to expand the East Aurora NPP zone, as well as two options which, if the East Aurora NPP is expanded, could be implemented along Baseline Frontage Road and Aurora Avenue to support the holistic parking management of the area. Options one through four are as they relate to the NPP zone, and options A and B are for the ramp blocks outside the MPP zone, which if the zone is expanded would need to be managed for a holistic approach. Option one is to take no action at this time. We could revisit the petition if conditions change in the future. Option two is to expand the East Aurora NPP to cover only the blocks that petitioned. Option three is to expand the NPP to the proposed blocks, which include both the petitioned and the non-petitioned blocks. 
Option four will entail additional engagement activities uh, and program development activities. This could include other options, such as bringing CU to the table in a more meaningful way. If the NPP were to be expanded, staff are recommending that baseline frontage road to the south and the sections of Aurora Avenue not included in the NPP be managed as part of ramp. The options for managing parking on the identified block ramp blocks outside the proposed NPP include option A for time-limited parking to mirror the regulations in the NPP and option B for paid parking. Option B would include 90 minutes of free parking followed by unlimited paid parking for a maximum of 72 hours starting at the base rate for on-street parking. Although the data suggests that the area would benefit from parking management, and that parking congestion is severe, especially on the blocks closest to Williams Village. There is not sufficient support from residents to expand the existing NPP or management of surrounding ramp blocks at this time. Based on the comments received, staff suggests that additional community engagement and program development activities take place over the summer and fall, and staff return to TAB and Council later this fall. Assuming TAB support for the staff recommendation, Staff will re recommence outreach and engagement activities with the East Aurora neighborhood and program development activities. The questions we have for TAB are, does TAB have any feedback on the proposed criteria modifications for RAMP? And does TAB support staff's recommendation to conduct additional community engagement and program development activities and return to TAB and Council at a future date to revisit this petition? At this time, we can address questions from TAB members prior to the public hearing. Thanks, Samantha and Bill. Any questions for the team here? Becky? Thanks. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, one, uh, what, I'm just curious why high density residential is precluded from the program. So the program was developed originally to assist with issues regarding spillover um, to neighborhoods from uh, neighboring uh, traffic generated in destinations. And so it doesn't address uh, like a high number of residents parking in those neighborhoods. And so currently the regulations for the NPP program state that high density residential neighborhoods are not included or not or are precluded or are, uh, would not qualify for an NPP. Do they qualify for any, for like other parking management? Some other part of our parking management like universe? That would be potentially a question for transportation and mobility, but they would not qualify for anything under ramp currently. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is, uh, I didn't quite understand why long term parking doesn't support paid parking. Oh, wait, well, now as I'm saying it, maybe it's making sense. So is it because it's because somebody wouldn't bother to like, they're not going to park there because they need long term parking and they don't need short term parking. So why would they pay anything for a short? OK, that's great. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thanks. Just had to think through it a little more. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, that was my only other question. Thank you. Brian or Trini, you have any questions? Brian? Um, thanks, Alex. Um, first, Tila had a note that or memo that came in, and I don't know if there's a way to make that part of the the, the docket here, but she had a quite quite some some um, I don't know specific points. Um, should I? Can those be incorporated, summarized at least in the minutes? I think I've seen that in the past. I'm seeing a nod from Natalie. Yes, yeah, so I think her feedback can be incorporated. Um, Brian, was there a question in there that you yeah, wanted? Yeah, to I just wanted to give Tila a chance to go first. Um, so um, I, yeah, thank you, um, Bill and Chris and, and um, Samantha and team. I just have a few questions about the um, what I think is two elementary schools on the 
the the top left of the map. Is it is it possible to show the map of the Aurora and the 30th streets? Is that is that thank you? Do I have that right? The top left there, Aurora, uh, and left of the base or yeah. I'm sorry, to, I said top left, to the right. So basically above 39th Street and Aurora, that's BCSIS Elementary School and then High Peaks Elementary School adjoining it, right? Is that right? Okay, um, thank you. So I, that's what I thought. I didn't, I don't think I heard much about those elementary schools, uh, two of them, so adjoining. Um, I heard a lot about CU. So I guess I'm, I have a few questions just as far as like how, whether and how, um, the perspective of what's happening with those schools um, is, is a part of this whole parking picture in the neighborhood. Um, and I suppose my, so maybe I have three questions. The first one is just, is there any general, I don't know, thing that the team could offer on as far as like, what what are the dynamics around this parking situation with, with school traffic? So like, it sounds like non-resident traffic is an issue. Are many of those teachers and parents searching for parking or not? Or yeah, just could you say anything about that? What I could perhaps offer is that the proposal um, had parking regulations going up to about a block before the elementary school. So there would have been um, unmanaged parking for any activities related to that school. Um, on the block after 39th Street. Um, but we didn't see super high density or high occupancy parking um, too far to the east of 39th Street, but we didn't extend our study that far in that direction either. We were primarily occupied with the petition blocks and just the surrounding blocks. And I don't know if, Bill, you wanna add anything else? Yeah, I, I would only offer, um, in addition to that, just from my prior experience with the city, um, that the predominant parking impacts in and around that school mostly had to do with pick up and drop off activity, not with long term parking. Um, okay. they, they provide for long term parking on their site. There certainly are pick up and drop off issues that impact that neighborhood, but that would not be um, likely to be impacted by the NPP. Okay, so then, it, so then, from a like a first principles, I guess perspective, I'm hearing, sure, there's there's a couple of schools there, but it's not clear that that would be whether there's an NPP or not, or whatever NPP design. There, there's not. Don't expect there to be much, um, I guess, interaction with the school. Okay, and does that include? I'm thinking about pedestrians and um, bicyclists trying to get to school. Would this, can you imagine either way, whether you, you know, regardless of what recommendation that, that there's a, there's an implication here for safety or, or um, I guess, vehicle level, traffic levels that would affect active tra travelers? Well, I believe there are bike lanes along Aurora Avenue, or at least it's, it's a, a bike path along Aurora Avenue. And so if we managed parking, along Aurora Avenue, it would be safer for cyclists and pedestrians trying to get to the school if they were coming from 30th, for example. The proposed parking management um, for Aurora Avenue under ramp, not part of the MPP, so it's not shown on this map, but it would basically extend from where the dotted yellow lines end all the way to 39th Street. So um, ideally, you know, managing the parking there would help reduce congestion and then create safer conditions for cyclists and pedestrians. And yeah, same for baseline frontage road as well. Yeah, there's generally understood to be a correlation between um, reducing motor vehicle traffic and a, a safer environment. And that's part of the goal. Okay. The so, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe I did Miss, miss that sort of big idea. So, so in general, the NPP, you you would say, if you, if you pursue it, would would uh, tend to reduce motor vehicle traffic in the area overall, and less conflicts with bikes and beds. Yes, and if I might interject, when we see block faces that are overutilized when it comes to parking, you're going to see more vehicles that are approaching parking spaces that are closer to stop signs, um, driveways. 
And when you have that uh, amount of um, activity, there's a lot more uh, blind spots and issues with sight triangles that lead to uh, crashes. Okay, so maybe what I would summarize that I've heard is the team is aware that there's there's a couple of schools there considered what you know that the, whether or not there are key impacts what you know with respect to which direction we go with it here doesn't seem to be a substantive um, reason not to and in fact if we went forward it, you would expect it to reduce on average or probabilistically um, conflict uh, vehicle traffic and conflict is that fair yes. Great. Okay. And then um, just for th to be thorough, the um, did, so it sounded like there wasn't like a real signal from in the petition, like a real signal representing stakeholders from the school, like, you know, parents or resident, I guess, residents talking about school traffic or teachers or they just, there wasn't, this was not, despite there being the school, it just wasn't really reflected. They weren't coming out in the survey. It yeah. wasn't a prevalent theme. I think the theme was more surrounding CU students and the management of um, Williams Village. Okay. Okay. Um, I, th I think those are all my questions. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Any other questions from Tab, or can we open it for the public hearing? No, I just wanted to add that, you know, basically Ryan covered all my questions regarding, you know, pedestrian and cyclist safety. So <laughs> I don't have anything else. So. Okay. With that, we'll open up the public hearing. Thank you to the members of the public who stuck with us to this point. Now is the time. I see a couple of you found the raise hand tool. Use the raise hand tool within the Zoom platform, and our technical host will start calling on you, and you'll have up to three minutes to address the board. All right. Um, whoever sharing screens, can we have that stop sharing, please? Thank you. All right, looks like Mike has their hand up. Mike, could you confirm you're able to speak? Yes, can you hear me? Perfect, yes, you may start. Thank you, uh, thanks to the board and thanks to the outside experts who consulted on this. My name is Mike Chaffin. I've been a resident of Boulder since 2009, a, of, a resident of the neighborhood since 2014, and I've been a homeowner in the neighborhood since 2017. Um, over the last six years since I bought my house, I haven't noticed any change in parking utilization on my street um, due to the construction of the large dormitories at Willville. I saw no change. Um, and partially as a consequence of that, I want to speak in strong opposition to the creation of this zone. For me, the zone does not solve a problem. Um, neither I nor any of my guests or any of the service workers that I have uh, had to my house. I've had a difficulty finding parking. There's always spots available next to my house or um, in one or two houses to either side. Um, it's not an issue. Um, in the permit zone on the north side of the neighborhood, the streets are nearly empty. They're less than 35% full. I just want to note that that less than 35% um, is nearly the complement of the 60% threshold that's used for the expansion. So it's clear that residents in the parking uh, zone that currently exists could still find parking even if the parking spots were 60% occupied most of the time. Um, with regard to the 60% threshold, I do wanna raise a question because this expansion increases the size of the area by a factor of more than four. Um, I have to wonder whether the 85% threshold is more valid, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the reason for the expansion is different than the reason for the creation of the original zone. So it doesn't solve a problem for me. In fact, it creates a problem because now I'll need to manage parking for me and my household, for my guests and for service workers. Um, I understand the process for purchasing permits and for purchasing temporary permits, uh, but this just creates additional cognitive load for me uh, in terms of deciding whether to use a visitor permit for service workers who might be performing uh, plumbing repairs or roof repairs for my house versus um, uh, guests that might be coming for a week um, later in the year. Um, so in conclusion, because it does not solve a problem for me um, and because it creates a problem, this proposed parking restriction does more harm than good. Um, I would urge the council to uh, take note of the fact, sorry, the board to take note of the fact that uh, nearly 70% of residents oppose the zone. Um, and I would urge the board to respect the vote of the people in this matter and reject this proposal via option one. 
um, and uh, find a test case that will be more suited to putting a zone in place. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mike. All right, Thomas, I'm gonna ask you if you're able to unmute. Unmute, can you hear me? Perfect, yes, can we begin? Yeah, uh, my name is Thomas David Kehoe. I'm here with my neighbor, Mary Shelton. Helton. Um, we live on 31st Street. We live on 31st Street. Um, uh, first of all, it sounds like you're recommending option four, continued uh, discussion and community involvement. Uh, could we do an experiment on a couple of the blocks or say, we get metered paid parking on 31st, we get the three hour time limit on 32nd. Um, I think that if we could see this and experience this, um, you'd, you'd get more community involvement and community interest and, and dis, dis discussion about this. Second, um, I wrote in my written uh, comment a third proposed option um, that if you don't want to do paid parking, could we at least get um, painted parking spaces on the street? Uh, there's th uh, room to park three cars in front of each of our houses. And what I see is that the first car parks kind of in the middle, the second car parks behind the first car, leaving a three quarter space on one side and a one quarter space on the other side. And then a third car tries to park in the three quarters um, length uh, space and ends up partially block blocking well, my also drive driveway. Um, if 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 we had the painted parking spaces, it would increase the number of cars that could park, and it would uh, reduce the number of parking tickets, uh, and reduce the number of blocked um, driveways. And my neighbor would like to uh, to say something. Thank you. Uh, ooh. I. I noticed that um, I think even if you have, you know, we have to pay to park in the street or we have the three white lines that, re you know, keep it down to three cars in front of a house, all the spaces are always going to be full. I don't think you're going to counteract students who don't want to pay the $500 a year at CU, they're still gonna try to park. And what's gonna happen, sure, I have a pass for my guest. Well, that's fine, but there's not gonna be a, a space once they arrive in the neighborhood. Kids are gonna park for whatever, the two, two, three hour limit, zoom to another space, immediately they leave the first space, a second student or not a student is gonna pull in there. I think, it's not a, actually a good solution. And I don't think all those students live at the dorms. I mean, they do need a place to park. I think drawing the white lines, the good old fashioned way, paint is so cheap, go for the paint. Um, it'd be a nice, at least beginning, simple solution. And we could see how it works. Do you have more to say, David? No. I think that's my basic input. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Meredith, did you catch the second name? Okay. All but right. For the record. Um, Jason, I will ask you to unmute. Please confirm you're able to do so. Can we hear me? Very faintly. Very faintly. Uh, oh, there, that's a lot better. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Jason Filesticker. I'm a PhD grad student in Kimmy. So I live in this zone because I wanted to be close to East Campus for my work. Um, I strongly agree with everything that Mike said. All of that checks out and makes total sense to me. Um, 
I only agree with Thomas's statement regarding maybe painting lines, because uh, I do see sort of a, a very inefficient use of the parking spaces um, occasionally. Uh, I'm glad to hear that the recommendation to the board is uh, not to immediately implement it and to at least look into options, I guess, further. Um, I do think that the proposed expansion, as Mike said, would just be a, another mental burden. And while the cost is not incredible, still another cost to tack on to a poor grad student. Um, and I do think that a decent number of these houses are rented out to uh, students and graduate students who would not appreciate extra cost. And also the social burden that it would bring as well, right? Grad student or grad student, grad school itself is sort of a mentally and socially taxing thing. Uh, so being able to have gatherings and not have to worry about parking uh, is sort of a nice thing to have, uh, especially you know if people uh, indulge themselves and you don't want people driving home and you would like to be able to offer a couch and not have to worry about them getting towed, ticketed, or anything like that. Um, it would be nice not to have to worry about that. Uh, I think that engaging with CU to remedy the relatively high barrier to parking uh, financially at Williams Village would be probably the best solution moving forward. I don't know how feasible that is. Uh, I don't know what type of negotiating power the board has here, um, but I think that that would probably be the best way is to address it at the cause, not try to remedy it in a sideway um, yeah, I can also comment on the parking usage regarding the elementary school and the attached park. Uh, pick up and drop off is not a problem uh, with students and parents. Uh, the bigger problem is probably the Little League baseball that comes through seasonally uh, and fills up a lot of spots uh, on the north side. But even that is not a huge problem. And I feel that the white lines proposed by uh, uh, Thomas would probably help a lot with that. A lot of those people park very inefficiently. They're here quickly and get to their game as needed. But yeah, overall, I don't approve of it. Um, and that's about it, I suppose. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Drew, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Please let me know if you're able to do so. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. You may begin. Great. OK, thank you guys very much for, for inviting us to comment here. Uh, my name is Drew Morrill. Uh, I live at 885 39th Street, and that's just on the corner of Aurora and 39th, right across the street from the school. Uh, I've lived here for about six years, and throughout that whole time, I've commuted uh, to work by bicycle on Aurora Ave. Um, and I do not think that this uh, NPP is necessary. In fact, I strongly oppose it. I think that it will ultimately just cause a lot of stress among residents. Um, I mean, frankly, nobody likes having parking vultures hovering around their neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I, I actually did bring up the school in my survey response, and I, I just wanted to say that Ryan, when he spoke earlier, was correct that uh, most of the parking on my street is associated with that school, uh, and also, you know, things like uh, park activity, Little League, baseball stuff. But, you know, we're part of a community, and um, the school is is the bedrock of our community and, and the park is is so important. And, you know, if people come and fill up my street because they're teachers teaching in a school, well, that's fine with me. Um, I don't want to add any stress to their lives. Um, and I also wanted to tell you about my neighbor, Camila. Uh, she lives just behind me. Um, she's a Spanish speaker and was a little hesitant to speak, but she's a senior citizen who uh, recently lost her husband. Um, and she does not own a car, um, but over the course of the past year or two, there were constantly hospice workers coming and going to her home. Um, and it's just kind of hard for me to imagine how she would navigate the system. Um, and I, I just think it'd be confusing and stressful for her. And it's, it's just frankly unnecessary. The photos that you guys showed earlier of 31st and 32nd Street, they just frankly don't represent my, my neighborhood at all. Um, and I, I am sympathetic to people who are maybe closer, farther, farther west, um, but, Frankly, you know, in, in terms of my neighborhood, I don't think this would be a, a, an improvement. Um, I wanted to also mention that um, before the pandemic, we had an RTD bus line that went along Aurora Avenue. That was the 209 line. Uh, and at the start of COVID, that was shut down. 
So, you know, I think if, if the intention is to reduce motor vehicle traffic in the area, um, trying to revamp um, the 209 would be uh, a great thing because it really connected my neighborhood with the university and other parts of, um, of, of town. So, you know, uh, just to summarize, I, I do um, strongly oppose this measure. I don't think it's necessary. I think it would add a lot of stress to our lives. Um, I think one of the stated goals earlier uh, of the program was to generate revenue and achieve cost recovery. And that's kind of what it feels like, you know, start a program and then have it pay for itself by, uh, by our parking citations. And I, I don't like to feel that, but anyway, thank you guys very much for considering my opinion. Thank you, Drew. All right, Brandy, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Please confirm you're able to do so. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are, you may begin. Right on. So um, my first comment is to, um, I don't know, think about a holistic approach um, and please consider what the new rules of increasing the number of unrelated people that can live in houses in our neighborhood, that if we increase the number of people who unrelated people who can live in our neighborhood, there will be more cars. That means more need for permits, which means that a landlord would have to provide a permit um, in order that they could rent their homes um, and or just increasing the number of people and cars coming to our neighborhood. Um, I also would like to acknowledge that baseline frontage road is really the problem. In my opinion, I, I live three houses away from the frontage road and I am really actually quite disturbed that this road is not included in the NPP. Um, there are CU employees who use this. There's homeless people who use this. Um, maybe simply putting out a place for the people to use the toilet or to clean up the trash that is incurred on the frontage road would be much appreciated such that the people could actually park there and live there for 72 hours without causing stress to our community. Um, I, again, just want to iterate that the problems are the baseline front edge road. It's people blocking the stop sign at 35th Street, people blocking our fire hydrants, people parking in the wrong direction, facing in the wrong direction, people parking too far from the curb. Um, and really, it's just the rules that we currently have are not enforced. So if we can't enforce the rules that we have now, I'm not sure how $40 a house here is going to get that, that problem to, to happen. We do have two homes that I believe need to be considered. 710 34th Street has no parking, usable parking in front of their house due to stop signs and fire hydrants. And um, 71036th Street, their driveway is on Frontage Road and they get parked in all the time, have a child and they can't leave their home. Um, I, think, I think we just need a survey of the people parking on Baseline Frontage Road and I'm disturbed that that is not in this plan. Thanks, Brandy. All right, um, it looks like we have one more question from Lee. Lee, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, how's my audio? Great. That's great. My name is Lee Payne. I live in the Northwest area uh, that's under consideration here. Um, I've lived in the same house for 21 years. Uh, I am going on my 12th year of biking to BCSIS with my three children, um, walked um, this neighborhood in a great extent as my children grew up. <clears throat> I would classify uh, the issues that we're seeing more as a, an annoyance and not so much a management issue, in my personal opinion. I think uh, Fox Tuttle did a great job of assessing that it's primarily residents and seasonal issues with students. 
Um, and given the fact that the off-street parking requirements for single-family residential probably does not equate to the number of residents that are in the house, it's always probably going to be a resident issue. Uh, I personally don't feel like that that's a fair burden to place upon those renters, especially when the vast majority of them are students, as is the, the neighborhood itself. Uh, should this be implemented, I'd, I would have pretty great concern that the issue would just push north to Aurora and then the neighborhoods north of Aurora itself. Many students park in that area to go to the research park, so this is not simply overflow from Williams Village. It's an issue that permeates itself towards north, and I feel like that that issue would uh, then be exacerbated as this as it just permeates other parts of the neighborhood. Um, and to that end, uh, as I mentioned, I've biked to BCS IS for BCSAS for uh, going on 12 years next year. Um, it, it, there is safety concerns on that street. We bike to school every day. The traffic control measures that have been installed on that street have reduced parking and they've decreased biker safety by pushing bicyclists into the flow of traffic instead of being able to hurt, hug the curb um, when cars are not parked there. And as I mentioned, I feel like that that issue will be exacerbated as well as probably early school events, not only for drop-off, but also for classes and the circulation in those areas. There, there is a big drop-off issue and pickup issue um, it's not that far to walk if you end up having to park in the neighborhood, should it be allowed, but bicyc bicycling uh, is, is pretty unsafe. Uh, the geometry of the intersection of Aurora and 35th is not well suited for the round temporary, the same roundabout that's been installed there. I've seen several crashes there because of that. Um, and those, those measures which have been removed <clears throat> as, you, as you continue east on Aurora and get towards Mo Mohawk have been removed and the bicycling there is much safer. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Anyone else interested in speaking? I'm not seeing any additional hands. Okay. Lynn Siegel, CAP CU's uh, enrollment. That's what needs to be done for prevention of the problem. And with CU South, it's gonna spread throughout this whole community. They need to stop enough already, enough of a good thing, too much of a good thing, I should say. <laughs> That's what needs to be done. Prevention, done. Thanks, Lynn. All right, it looks like there's no one else. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and open it up for tab discussion with the opportunity to provide a recommendation if we would like. Uh, one thing that came up through this question for staff is the prospect of marking spaces on a residential street. Is that something that the city does to maximize the amount of cars that can fit on a, along a certain curb? Looks like Natalie wants to... Oh, for Devin. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was going to ask Devin to respond to that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, that is certainly something that we do in uh, various areas. One area was near um, Chautauqua as a means of the um, program there to manage parking, and certainly in the downtown area. Um, it is something we could potentially consider for East Aurora. However, um, there are challenges with that as well, and, and namely being the maintenance aspect, as well as folks um, seemingly not following those markings as well as people think they might. Um, so th those are some of the challenges with the parking uh, spaces being marked. Okay. Have members? have any leaning anyway on the the options that were presented yeah um i uh i guess my i have a few concerns about option four um well i guess i'll mention one at the start and um maybe i just missed this in the past but i think the fact that the program only serves low density residential is a little is concerning to me because 
effectively, I guess I'm assuming the whole city, you know, everyone pays for a program that only serves a portion of neighborhoods based on the characteristics of housing in those neighborhoods and whether it's multifamily or single family homes and creating that dichotomy with no real rationale to me is like really, that's really concerning because it seems like a really big inequity in how we provide services to community. Um, so that's kind of just like a bigger concern of mine. Um, but beyond that, uh, I guess further my concern is that with option four, I'm not really clear what we would gain, like what would be gained either by the community or by the city at large by spending more time on this decision. There's been a lot of analysis done and I understand it was part of developing broader kind of policy policy recommendations. And so that's why maybe it was more extensive than it would be like in the future when it was repeated. But um, but I'm yeah, I'm concerned about spending more time on it because I'm not clear there's much to be gained. And um, also for the same reason of with the different density of housing that, you know, a lot of that we're sort of supporting, the whole city is supporting this work and it's focused on a very small area and a lot has been done, analysis and outreach and conversation, and it doesn't feel like a very efficient use of resources to keep having the conversation without any kind of clear change in outcome that would result in, in my view. I'm not sure like what other option would arise. And um, I don't support bringing CU into it. I just, I feel like CU is not responsible for every aspect of the lives of people who go to school there or work there, you know, they have a role, but it does not extend, I think, to every aspect of how each person at CU travels around. Um, and so I don't, I don't see this as a CU issue. You know, they've priced their parking, they've put a value on parking they have on their land. Um, and that may be dissuading some people from, from bringing a car at all to the city, you know, that could be what it's doing. So which, you know, I think many would see as a benefit. Um, but yeah, I guess just a, a kind of few more points on that, which is that, yeah, I think the community members deserve an answer one way or another, whether we're going to move forward or not. And also, if we have criteria to decide that either we're going to use that criteria or we aren't, um, and if we've built all this criteria, gotten all this information, gotten all this input, and we still don't know, I then maybe is you know is does that mean it's not working what we've done I, you know i'm just i'm kind of confused about why none of that is enough to to move forward one way or another um and i think you know we need to move on to other places that might merit if we decide no this doesn't merit management then you know there's other place parts lots of other parts of the city other communities that also deserve you know equal attention um whether or not that's however we arrive at, at which ones we focus on. Um, and I think also ultimately, you're never gonna know what the whole neighborhood thinks because we never get full participation in polling. So we don't really have a representative view of what the neighborhood thinks. And that's you know pretty much impossible to get without a representative poll, which is hard to do. So you know we can keep polling people, we can keep asking people and we'll keep getting different viewpoints, but ultimately we need to have some path for, for making a decision and then moving on and being able to replicate it in a kind of an efficient way that recognizes that we can't spend an undue amount of resources on a limited part of the city, especially since the program is already focusing on a limited part of the city by excluding people who live in, in uh, higher density housing. So that's why I support making a decision one way or another, probably option one or option three. Um, and I'm not very supportive at the moment of um, option four, but you know, interested in hearing other tab members' thoughts. Thank you. Hit most of my points. Um, Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to have? I saw your hand. Yeah. Oh, is it up? Oh. Um, well, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can do this, but but um, Be Becky, you've germinated a question, which is I I now uh, realizing I don't I'm not sure I fully grasp. To what extent city code just gives us the definitions for what staff needs to do versus staff has more discretion. I think there's a goes back to 1981, the MPPs established and sort of 
gives us what we have. And so I, I don't know if it's possible to ask staff on that, but I think implied implied in your feedback is like, can staff, not to in your mouth, but what I'm thinking of is like, can, you know, does staff have the ability to, I don't know, re retool to some extent or or no, are we, is, are we sort of fully working with what we have for city code in, in setting up these four options? Um, I don't know if, Chris or Bill or Samantha, what is, do I have that right? That city code really defines NPP as we, okay, yeah. Yes, that's correct, Ryan. The, the code that pertains to neighborhood parking permit zones clearly describes what the process is for establishing or expanding zones. And TAB has the option to accept whatever plan staff has put forward. Um, we're not recommending that you do that based on uh, community engagement. Um, the plan that we have put forward uh, along those uh, lines is the petition zone with the added streets. Um, if TAB wanted to recommend that that um, NPP uh, be um, uh, pursued and implemented, then the next step is to put that on the council consent agenda um, within 30 days. And then council has the option to call it up um, and uh, take it another direction or approve on consent and then staff would get uh, to work on implementation. Thanks, Chris. And so I think the, the uh, what I read is just, we have a 40 year old city code that defines some of these goals and aims that I think, uh, Tab members, including me, are not extremely satisfied with that. You know, this this goes literally a character, neighborhood character is written into the city code there. So um, I don't know. I guess I'm so now I'm making a comment. I'm just recognizing that um, there is there is some uh, there's city code is def defining some of the parameters that are causing some <laughs> indigestion here. Um, so anyway, that's just my observation. I guess I would just say, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of torn I, I, between agreeing, Becky. I, I agree with what you said. I also um, maybe just stepping back though. I um, I think I mean that's here. I, I appreciate what staff has done and is doing within the bounds of the law and resources available. And um, you know, Tila Tila had in her her memo that we'll we'll get into the minutes. Um, just to summarize her 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 top line, it was a uh, number four. Go with number four. Um, not for the reasons that um, she has a, a, some comments about it, but but um, sort of torn between supporting that um, and and saying I like where you're I like where you're going, Becky. That like you know if 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 we just need to make it if a decision needs to be made, like can we really are we going to know more later? Um, so I don't know. I I I, I, I sort of tend towards number four and just you know giving staff the um, the 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 space to, I guess, just to, to sort of trust them to, to pursue what they can within the bounds of what's legal. And um, and then I would just follow this with, I could be convinced otherwise, but that, that's how I'd be leaning. Um, but then I'd also feel compelled to say something very similar to what I did when we talked about the CIP, which is, um, I think it would help if we had a, the right, if we had a forum to consider the strategic issues here as as whether it's tab or it's or it's city staff um and and that is that we don't have a very good functioning uh system of trans transportation options which is something that our uh, commenter uh drew moral pointed at so when parking comes up we're collectively in a scarcity mindset not just in divvying up who gets parking privileges but literally saying that boulder is too full for more people um but you know if we had in my view, in my imagination, if we had transit buses running up and down Boulder every quarter mile, uh, each 15 minutes, latitudinally and longitudinally, um, and if parents and kids really would say they, they could ride bikes safely to the schools in the neighborhood and to the destinations, I would imagine that the level of worry about parking, which is really about where people are going to have to store an expensive vehicle they have to own, um, would start to um, dissipate, maybe not totally, but would start to erode. So that's bigger than the scope of this proceeding, but I also don't think a proceeding like this should go by without us labeling this, calling it out, um, especially if it's something the council is going to see. 
um, and pointing out what, what are the options on the table for Boulder strategically to get this right and go beyond a scarcity mindset to thinking about abundance and um, what, a, what a real multimodal system looks like. So I'll step down and I, again, I'm happy to support number four and I appreciate staff's uh, work on this. Thanks, Ryan. I think if we were to do anything, the most logical thing to me would be to include, expand the zone to include the non-petition spaces and try to incorporate any of the negative, any of the feedback that's been gathered so far to improve upon what you've proposed. I think the extent to which this has been studied and analyzed and the community has been engaged is rather robust for how much of the, an impact this is and, and just the limited resources that the city has. Uh, that said, I think I'm leaning towards option one and taking no action. I second you, Alex. I think that even though it's really hard to get like an accurate number of people that would represent accurately um, the people that live there, like Becky said, I mean, we have heard uh, a number of people that actually live there that have lived there for years and years and years um, express and take the time to come and express that on this forum, which I think is very valuable in itself. Um, so. I don't know. I'm 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 with you, Alex. I think that maybe just kind of focusing on a different area that may be more prevalent for the monies that the city can invest in, opposed to yeah. And I'm not necessarily saying like a different area that like might be retooling the NPP or focusing on limited staff resources on another challenge that we have got plenty before us. So we've conducted a public hearing, so we have the opportunity to provide a formal recommendation to council, although we are not required to do so. Uh, is there a motion that anyone would like to bring forward or a thought that we would wanna work to turn into a motion? Mm -hmm. Can I just, Alex, can I just say one more thing before we do this? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think um, the, the, I don't know if this goes into the motion, but to me, the the what council should hear is city code needs to get fixed. That's the that we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep doing this, and, and and you know having this sort of well staff, are you doing it right? Unless we fix city code, so we we know it. Why don't we say it and use this as an opportunity to focus on that? Well, that's my okay. Guess. Yeah, we can certainly put whatever verbiage we want into the motion. So, would the motion be? tonight to follow option, recommend option one to council. And then Ryan, do you wanna add some context for council on why we reached that and what might be? Well, I'm useful? I'm actually a little bit hesitant to, to okay. uh, oppose, I don't know if oppose is the right word, but I, I'm inclined to go with what staff is recommending, which is option four while saying also city council we have a you know 40 year old code that this is all based on and everybody's frustrated and disappointed in the community well you know all kinds of problems with it but to give staff the um the space to you know follow what what they'd like to recommend that's, that's my instinct and i think that's what i don't want to put words in Natila's mouth but she also did support that um in her conclusion i guess becky where do you stand at the moment um, I definitely support, I appreciate Ryan that you looked at the code, um, the ordinance and to understand that you know, that's the foundation of some of the, the problems here. And um, I think it would be great to use the opportunity to tell council that that needs to change. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but I also would, um, I mean, I'm, I support option one. I support option three. I don't feel too strongly about between those two. Um, I don't support an option four, um, just because I just I just don't see I just don't know I don't see an outcome that would be any different from the ones we have before us. I'm just not I just can't envision what kind of input would change anything we've already seen um, or any factors. So um, yeah, but I I support the recommendation on the ordinance change. Okay, so it sounds like we could have. A unanimous recommendation if we didn't touch the options, but had provided broader feedback. 
Um, I think I agree with Becky on this. And so the only way we would have a three person supporting any individual thing would be if Trini, you were comfortable with, um, I think I would stick to option one. So if Becky, me, Trini supported option one, we'd have a majority, but I'd also be, I'm not dead set on doing anything. So we could just have a unanimous thing about improving the code and the programs available. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I would go for that as well. But then, what what what, what happens with a option four? I mean, we just don't make a recommendation. Chris, yeah. I might try yeah, and yeah, please. Yeah, so um, also included in code um, around residential access management is an annual report where we take a look at problem areas throughout the city. So if tab. Um, was to vote on option one, uh, no action for this particular neighborhood at this time. It doesn't mean that we won't still continue to track it in the same way that we're tracking um, problem areas throughout the city. So um, the the tag layer, the, the additional information in option was one is um, no action at this time until conditions change. And those changing conditions could be a revision to um, uh, neighborhood parking ordinances that provide us other tools to mitigate these uh, the challenges experienced in this neighborhood. Okay, that's helpful, Chris. Does that change any? It sounds like Chris, you're nudging me to to say number one is is fine without causing a bunch of heartache for staff. You're smiling, so I'm gonna change my vote. So yeah, I, I'm happy to go with the the group here on number one with the uh, note, some kind of a note on the. That we think that city code is um, or our 40 plus year old city code it is continually problematic in these proceedings about parking and needs attention. I would be happy to support that. And is that in the context of RAM? Do we want to? try to provide some guidance to council on where they might make headways here, or do we want to, are you fine leaving it vague as just the code needs updating? Well, Becky, go ahead. You were gonna, oh, I thought you were opening your mouth. Um, I think there's something about alignment with with park, you know, our, our parking policy and our, our goals that are embodied in the TMP. I don't know if we spill all that out, but Vision Zero, Mode Shift, uh, VMT Reduction, Climate Action, that, that you know, that, that these things are, um, can be at odds because of how code is written and we should seek a uh, city code that is advancing us in the future direction that we want to head. I guess I'd add, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if there are other parts of it um, I have not looked at the, the code on this, but um, I mean, specifically that programs should not distinguish between whether neighborhoods merit being served based on the type of housing in the area. Okay, I'm trying to pull this into a motion. So move the tab recommend option one, which is no action and that we would like to see city code be updated to expand the tools available within the neighborhood parking program to better advance our TMP goals and ensure that all neighborhoods within the city are eligible for Uh, consideration in the program. That seems close. I don't know about I, I don't know about tools as much as just alignment with. So the par parking policy should be aligned with. I think uh, the tools could be pricing. Who's eligible? Yeah, alignment. Al I would think of al alignment is a more fundamental 
explanation of, of where you're trying to head in my, I don't know, maybe that's just my language. Yeah, okay. Welcome this, amendment. I, I forgot what the words were, the long sentence was. Um, Expand the tools available within the NPP to better advance our TMP goals. To align, I would I would prefer align with rather than advance, but I, I don't care. I, it's fine. You did a good job of. Okay, yeah. align with TMP goals. Any other edits or feedback, support, opposition? A second. Did you get second? Oh, did you get seconded? Sorry, I wasn't soft. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Any other discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion or a, a vote. All those in favor? Okay, well, that passes unanimously. Is that all you need from us, Chris? Yes, thank you so much, Tab, and thank you, Sam and Bill and the rest of the folks who've been working on this item for um, some time. And we're looking forward to continuing the conversation on that, that bigger uh, level of uh, working with planning and transportation and mobility on some um, uh, retooling or alignment uh, of, our, of the tools that we have available to better uh, serve broader goals. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. team. And Meredith, I'll try to type this up and email the wording to you if you didn't catch it. Okay, I will do that. And thanks to the members of the public who spoke to us tonight and, uh, and stuck around for our, our discussion. Looks like we're a little bit behind schedule as we move to agenda item four. These will be two concept plan reviews for first the or maybe at the same time, 2206 Pearl and the Pearl East Innovation Building. And I'm not sure who I'm turning this over to. That's me. Welcome, Chandler. Hello. Yes, Chandler Van Scott, um, Principal Planner with Planning and Development Services. And yes, these are two um, active applications. Uh, both are site reviews that were referred to TAB by Council. And I will jump in here and share my screen you guys seeing my notes we are we're seeing your notes screen okay how's that there you go all right um, so I will do uh, 2206 Pearl first. I believe those listed first on the agenda. So um, and apologies, I thought it was item six looking at the agenda originally, but it's item four. Um, so uh, item six, this is, or item four um, is a site and use review at 2206 Pearl Street. Um, so project summary. Uh, this is a site and use review to redevelop 2206 Pearl Street with a new building consisting of 45 studio apartment dwelling units, uh, roughly 1,400 square feet of retail space and 700 square feet of uh, cafe or restaurant space. Um, they are requesting a 60% parking reduction to allow for 18 parking spaces where 45 are required. Um, in terms of the transportation system, um, the site is well located. Um, I know that's somewhat small, but you can see that um, the site is located on the hop, which runs along Pearl Street and is also um, nearby several other bus routes. Um, there's also existing um, on-street bicycle facilities uh, on Spruce and Walnut, um, about a block to the north and south of the subject site. Um, so the review process, uh, this went through concept plan review earlier this year and was referred to TAB by City Council. Um, they're currently in site review um, and council has uh, 
didn't provide a ton of specific feedback. So we are asking for um, recommendations and feedback on their parking management plan and their transportation demand management plan. Uh, ultimately, this will go to planning board for a final decision. Um, so key issue one is, does TAB have any feedback on the applicant's proposed TDM plan or parking management plan? Um, TDM strategies, and these were uh, also included in the staff memorandum. Um, so there are multiple bike and multi-use paths within the vicinity of the site. Uh, the applicant is proposing to provide um, NECO bus pass funding for residents, that's neighborhood eco pass and uh, business eco pass funding for employees. Uh, there are B-Cycle and Colorado car share locations within easy walking distance. Uh, they will be required to provide new um, enhanced sidewalks at the edges of the site to improve pedestrian activity. Uh, they're proposing a total of 98 bike parking spaces um, consisting of 28 short-term and 70 long-term spaces. Um, 25 of the long-term are in the garage and then one um, space in each of the residential units. Um, they're offering a monthly alternative transportation fund, um, which totals $150 a year for residents that don't have a vehicle um, and sign something saying as much. Um, the project owner is looking into options for Commutify, which is a local transportation consultant company to manage the alternative transportation fund. Uh, the lease is uh, proposed to include language that residents will not be allowed to have a vehicle to receive the alternate uh, transportation fund unless they can prove they have a suitable offsite location to store their vehicle. Um, secured storage area in the garage will accommodate parking and charging for e-bikes, e-scooters, and other micro mobility devices. Uh, there's a gear maintenance area and um, evaluation tools they're proposing include surveys and assessments to determine what strategies work best during the first three years and what should be adjusted moving forward. In terms of parking management strategies, um, they are providing unbundled parking, meaning um, that the cost of parking is separated from the cost of rent. So renters pay for an on-site parking space separately from the unit itself. Um, the monthly fee for on-site parking would be 125 to 150 a month. I don't think they've determined that yet. Um, renters who are car free would therefore save 1,500 to 1,800 a year in addition to the alternative transportation fund allowance. Um, in addition to the 18 spaces that they're providing, which meet code, um, they're also providing eight tandem spaces. Um, so city code doesn't count tandem spaces um, because they're blocking backing distance, but we do allow them. So if you count those as well, they're providing 26 spaces, not 18. Um, there's also an on-site car share space uh, with Colorado car share that will be funded by the developer. So residents will have the ability to um, use a car share vehicle. And then there's shared on-site loading, um, TNC space, which provides additional options for Uber, Lyft, deliveries, other ride shares, et cetera. Oops. Um, so that's the summary of my presentation. And now um, I'd be happy to answer questions or um, the applicant is also here to answer questions if the board has any. Thanks, Chandler. And do you want us to ask questions and then provide feedback on this concept before we move on to the second one? I mean, it's up to you guys. I, I feel like okay. that maybe might be a little bit easier, but um, if you want me to just jump into the second one, I'm happy to do that. Okay, let's maybe try to do that. Does Tab have any questions first on this concept plan? Chandler, can you flip it back to the previous slide, please? Sure. Thank you. I guess, Michael, can I, Alex, may I? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Chandler, just, I think just one question, just similar to a question I asked on a previous CDM presentation. Um, is there, was the, um, any chance there was any, like, I guess, survey work or um, anything that would represent an out, outreach done to a representative population asking, like, how this would help? Would they, would this be interesting, you know, as far as driving behavior change? Anything like that would suggest there's an empirical basis that this, you know, is going to make behavior happen. Um, um, I mean, there there's existing research. I don't know that the applicant has done any of their own surveys. Um, 
but there's definitely research supporting TDM overall as a, as a means of changing travel behaviors. Um, I might refer to uh, transportation staff if they're still on to discuss that. I don't know if um, if Chris is on here or not, but Chris could probably um, cite sure. existing research. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, we have a, a body of research um, from our both our residential travel diary and from our Boulder Valley employee surveys. We started doing those in 1990 and 1991, respectively. Uh, and we know for sure that uh, a combination, for example, of paid parking combined with eco passes is one of the best ways to change travel behavior. Uh, we have that documented in statistically significant surveys. Um, Typically, people with access to an eco pass not only take more work and school trips with the bus, but they also take non work trips. Uh, we know from our um, neighborhood eco pass surveys in the past that uh, families with neighborhood eco passes not only take the bus more, but they also walk and bike more. So we do have a lot of empirical evidence of this. Um, we do not have empirical studies on like the alternative transportation funds. The, this is a seldomly used uh, technique and really this is kind of a, a bonus on top of a, a really robust TDM plan uh, where you have the combination of the unbundled parking, the neighborhood eco pass, and then uh, people who don't have a vehicle, not only do they save by not having to pay for that parking because it's unbundled, uh, they're also getting a fund that could be used for something like buying a an annual um, B cycle membership, for example. So, um, so I think you know we we haven't done studies of that because we've used it so rarely. Um, but this is to me just an an added bonus on top of a very robust TDM strategy. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you both. And yeah, th that one hundred fifty dollar fund was sort of what I was thinking about. Is like, do we have an idea about the stringency of that and you know sensitivity at different levels? But um, but great, thank you. This is this is really really nice work. Um, no more questions. Chandler, sorry if I missed it. Did you say how many years the NICO bus pass funding would be in? Uh, three years to start. But okay. I, I believe that it's just, um, I think they're intending, if it's working for residents, um, they're intending to keep it going. I think that the plan is to kind of check in and monitor it after three years. Okay, and is this within an existing... Nico zone. Uh, I believe so. So to be absorbed into an existing, these residents would be eligible to continue in the Nico program with an existing neighborhood that's participating. It, it could be on its own. I, it's over um, forty units, so that's the minimum for RTD. So it could continue on its own. Uh, if it's not associated with an adjacent neighborhood to begin with. Um, and just, you know, something on the three years, you know, that's that's something our city attorney's office is comfortable with um, with having because the developer typically puts funding in escrow. Um, mm -hmm. We have been doing this for a long time. Uh, virtually, I think we had one instance where one development um, after the three years ceased the program within a year, the residents restarted it through their own HOA program to collect the fees. So um, I think in general, uh, we have about 100, <laughs> about 100% um, continuation of program after the three-year developer phase for residential developments. Are there developments in the past that have been five-year? There's been one, I believe it was Washington Village. Okay, okay, thank you. So for me, question-wise, any other questions from Tab on this one? Okay, and I guess might as well open up for feedback, uh, specifically requesting feedback on the parking strategy and the TDM. I would say I live pretty close to this and it's an incredibly walkable area with a lot of necessities in close proximity. I know the parking utilization in my building, which has one parking space per unit, and the units are up to three bedrooms, our overnight parking and is low, and it's even lower during the day, um, maybe 75, 80%. So a firm believer in an in investment in multimodal transit and 
bundled parking and, and these TDM strategies in this area. I think it's in a part of town that's that's well suited for uh, this type of development. So supportive of of the programs and the the plan that we're seeing. Alex, I, I I agree with you. Um, my only question is on the, the bike parking, and I would hope that it's um, as modern as possible in terms of uh, best you know best in class inverted use or um, use of those, but also plenty of space for e-bikes, ideally e-bike charging. Yes, I see long term and sh short term. I'm not sure what overnight what that means for security of the bikes. Um, so, but I, I'm supportive of it. I just would like to. See. Just you know, be able to tell people moving in that you know you can you can bring an e-bike. You don't need a car. It's a safe place to put it. Not going to be a problem. It'll be easy to navigate, and a lot, there's room for lots of people to do that. That'd be my only. But Becky, if she can correct me on, I guess ways to talk about that or say it, I'd refer to her. That's why Becky. It's better than me. Sorry, I missed just that last part you said, Ryan. It might. Audio cut out a little bit. Oh, sorry. I'm just saying. I think you know this. You know bikes better than me. So I, if you know, feel okay. free to correct me or, yeah. No, I think you're on point. Um, uh, I will just add my which will kind of kind of recurring theme for me that I just I think it we should make it easy for developments to um, not have to build parking they don't want or need. Um, so for that reason, I'm. It's great. Thanks, Becky. Trini, do you have anything on this one? If not, we can go ahead to the. Okay. All right, Chandler, do you want to move on to the Pearl East Innovation Building? Sure. Sorry, let me get my mouse back on my screen here. I've got two screens going, and sometimes the mouse only wants to work on one. There we go. Okay. Um, stop share for a sec. Are you guys seeing notes or presenter view or a presentation? Presentation. Okay, thanks. So moving on to the next item. This one is for a, a proposed development at 4845 Pearl East Circle, which is within the Pearl East Business Park. Um, this is a relatively um, old business park. It's about 32 acres. Um, it consists of nine developed lots with 11 buildings, um, lots of surface parking, um, and is located generally south of Pearl Parkway and east of Foothills Parkway, uh, north of the BNSF Railway, and west of the Cottonwood Grove open space. Um, the sites included in the current proposal are comprised of two parcels located at 4875 and 4845 Pirelli Circle. Uh, the two parcels are uh, approximately 173 or 174,000 square feet total. Um, so the project summary, this is a site review. Uh, the building as proposed is about 115,390 square feet located on what is currently an existing surface parking lot between 4845 and 4875 Pearly Circle. Uh, the building is three stories, 45 feet in height, which is by right height, um, designed for life sciences, um, a roughly mix of 60% lab and 40% supporting office space. Um, in terms of the transportation system, um, the site, as I said, is located on uh, Pearl Parkway. Um, there's also the multi-use path adjacent to Pearl Parkway, which runs immediately next to the site and connects to the multi-use path um, within the Cotton Grove open space. Um, I might let the applicant, I'm I'm not exactly sure of the um, status of the bus stop. Um, or the, the nearby bus stops, it says that they're closed currently, but I haven't actually been able to verify that personally. Um, there are There is a B-cycle station um, on site, which was just added by the developer. 
and then the existing site um, has detached sidewalks um, and uh, relatively strong pedestrian circulation for um, an office site. Uh, in terms of the review process, similarly, this went to concept plan um, in 2022. It was referred to TAB by City Council. Um, in this case, uh, Council asked for TAB recommendation and feedback on um, access and connectivity to the existing multimodal system, including connection of the building to Pearl Parkway and um, existing multimodal and pedestrian circulation. Um, as well as the project's alignment with the transportation goals of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and the Transportation Master Plan. Um, and this uh, actually incorrectly says planning board decision. This will be um, a staff level decision subject to planning board call up. Um, so key issue number one is, does the proposal provide adequate access and connectivity to the existing multimodal system, including connection of the building to Pearl Parkway, as well as existing multimodal and pedestrian facilities? Um, as you can see here on the site plan, um, the applicant, this is from uh, the applicant's um, package. Um, they are proposing a variety of improvements, um, a direct connection from the multi-use path to the front of the building. Um, they're also providing uh, bike parking at various locations around the building, um, a new south entry that connects to existing sidewalks within the park. And then, um, yeah, short and long term bike parking on both sides of the site. And key issue number two is is the proposed project generally consistent with the transportation goals of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan as well as the transportation master plan? Um, and as I mentioned in the memo, um, the the proposed project replaces a service parking lot in an office park that is currently uh, significantly over parked. Um, so they are not asking for a parking reduction, but they're um, bringing the overall office park um, closer to just code standards as opposed to being overparked. Um, so by repurposing this parking lot and creating new connections to the multimodal system along with TDM strategies, um, staff finds this project aligns with several goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan and TMP, um, including reduction of single occupancy, auto trips, uh, integrated transportation demand management programs, um, transportation impacts mitigated, uh, all, mode transpor all mode transportation system and safe and complete streets, low stress walk and bike network, uh, reduction of single occupancy auto trips, that's a repeat, um, et cetera. So I will go over the TDM strategies here. Hopefully everyone can um, kind of see these. So these are um, the TDM strategies that the applicant is proposing. So 34 short-term bike parking spaces, um, which meets the minimum code requirement. Um, same thing with long-term bike parking spaces, uh, 96 are proposed. Um, they're proposing to include um, ride-sharing information and employee orientation packets. Uh, this may include ego car sharing, B-cycle bike sharing, Dr. Cog's way to go, and ride-sharing with Uber slash Lyft. Um, pedestrian enhancements on the site, including um, improvements to existing sidewalks to improve connectivity. Um, there are also several proposed plazas with shade trees and seating located around the site. Um, bike enhancements. The site has uh, connections to existing sidewalks and paths in the vicinity, including um, existing multi-use paths along Pearl Parkway and Foothills Parkway. Um, there will be a bike room with direct access as well as lockers for short trip storage and a place to change shoes. Um, there will also be charging stations for e-bikes and a B-cycle station with eight bikes was recently added um, to the business park. Uh, there are showers proposed in the locker rooms. Proposed locker rooms will serve as suitable changing facilities. Um, I already said, uh, talked about the transportation information in the employee packets. Um, these, this applicant as well will be providing uh, BECO passes for employees. Um, same thing, three-year period, and then coordination following the initial three years. Um, and there'll be 81 parking spaces, which is uh, less than what's required by code for lot four, but um, it's also bringing, as I mentioned, the total parking spaces. Um, I think the, yeah, let's see, the combined campus, including the new building, requires 1,456 total parking spaces. And after this development, there will be 1,493 parking spaces. So there's still a surplus, but they are bringing it down. 
Uh, that is the end of my slideshow. And now I'd be happy to answer questions or um, to refer anything to the applicant if, if you have any questions for them. Thanks, Chandler. Any questions and or feedback? I don't have any questions, but um, I think it would support um, staff's assessment. And um, I do think it's exciting to um, see a development where there was this kind of extra empty parking lots. So um, yeah, in that regard, it sounds like a great project. Thanks, Becky. I don't have anything on this one, Ryan. Agree with Becky. Nothing to add. Thanks. Great, great work, staff and uh, developer. And Trini, you, you. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Chandler you. and team for joining us to be on standby. All right. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank Thanks. you. You too. And that concludes our main agenda items and brings us to matters. It looks like there are a few from staff, so I'll turn it over to Natalie and you can start directing yes. the different items. Sounds good. Thanks. We're going to start with regional transportation. Jean is here to provide that update. Yeah, you bet. Let me um, just take a second to get my screen set up. You got us all caught up. Good job. <laughs> there you go, Tim. Yeah. I know. I expected to be much later. Um, are you all <laughs> are you all seeing my my slide? My title slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. So um good evening, tab members. My name is Jean Sanson. I'm a principal transportation planner um, with the city, and I'm pleased to be here this evening. Um, on the regional transportation front, we have a lot to celebrate and a lot of work still ahead of us. So this evening, I'm just going to briefly share progress on three important initiatives that are helping us to meet our local and regional goals of enhancing equity, increasing access, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And these will be the Zero Fare for Better Air Transit Program, um, news on the Colorado 119 Safety and Mobility Improvement Project connecting Boulder to Longmont, and then and lastly, the next steps we're taking to advance the Colorado 7 East Arapaho Transportation Plan, connecting Boulder to our eastern neighbors. Okay, so jumping right in, um, the Zero Fare Transit Program. So during the months of July and August, I'm sure you all have heard, all RTD transit services will be free for riders to board, including local and regional bus routes and accessoride paratransit service. Um, the City of Boulder, in partnership with RTD and Via Mobility Services, will also provide zero fare services or is providing zero fare services on the local Boulder Hop bus route that you see here. Um, this is pretty neat. This is the second year of a statewide initiative to help reduce harmful air pollutants by increasing the use of transit and provides the opportunity to welcome back those whose travel habits have changed because of the pandemic. Um, last year, Boulder County, uh, Boulder City Council passed a resolution in support of Zero Fare for Better Air, and the initiative clearly aligns with the goals laid out in our city's transportation master plan. And then I think a fun factoid um, that's worth sharing is that in 2021, on-road emissions accounted for 26% of Boulder's greenhouse gas emissions. So by leaving their car at home just two days a week, community members can reduce their GHG emissions by over 3,000 pounds per year. So that's a kind of like fun factoid, factoid you can share with your neighbor or your friends when they're considering using transit and particularly trying it this month or next, given that um, the fare is essentially free. So please help us spread the word via your social media networks, your friends and your neighbors. And then I also wanted to share on a related note that in the middle of this two month initiative, later this month, the RTD board will be voting on a zero fare for youth pilot program um, for a period of up to 18 months, which um, would make transit free for all riders 19 years of age and under. And based on the results of the pilot and RTD's ability to secure um, stable funding for the program, it may be made permanent. So stay tuned and we'll keep you posted when um, a decision is made by the RTD board. So moving on to the next item, I wanted to share information on the Colorado 119 or Diagonal Project. 
So two weeks ago, we received the thrilling news from Congressman Jonah Goose that Boulder County is the recipient of a pretty monumental $25 million grant from the Department of Transportation. Um, this funding is made possible through the DOT's um, basically RAISE grant, which stands for Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity Discretionary Grant Program. That's a mouthful. We call it the RAISE grant. And I think you guys have probably read about this in the news. Um, but what this allows us to do is it completes a critical piece of $160 million plus funding puzzle for the entire project, which will include regional bus rapid transit, a commuter bikeway, and important intersection safety improvements, as you can see here. Together, these improvements will provide greater transportation options and safety for people using all modes of travel while supporting our mobility and transportation goals. You know, this successful um, funding package includes local, regional, state, and federal funding that's a result of over 10 years of collaboration and teamwork by all of our organizations and with much support from TAB, including the city of Boulder, Boulder County, Longmont, CDOT, and RTD. And this will allow us or allow CDOT to begin construction next year, providing a critical link to the city's 28th Street improvement project, which is also getting underway this summer. So some exciting news on that front. And last but not least is the Colorado 7 um, East Arapaho project. So we wanted to make you aware of some exciting progress on this project. Um, CDOT, I, as Lindsay mentioned earlier this evening, CDOT is initiating preliminary engineering on this um, segment of East Arapaho. So that would be what they are calling segment A. There are several segments within this regional corridor. We are the westernmost segment of Colorado 7, and we, we get the designation of being segment A. Um, between 28th Street and 63rd Street. So this is essentially the next phase of designing the long-term vision of the city's East Arapaho plan shown here on the left and adopted in 2018. The preliminary engineering project will help to advance and refine the East Arapaho vision to a 15% level of design, including cost estimates, whereby the city, as also mentioned earlier this evening, will then take the lead in advancing the western segment of the project between 28th Street and Foothills Parkway to final design next year, having secured TIP funding for this past year for that project. Um, so getting back to where we are today with the preliminary engineering project, CDOT launched a project website that you see here and an online presentation which offers an introductory overview of the project and encourages community members to participate and provide input and feedback various, via various public engagement opportunities that will be made available later this summer and through the fall. This presentation is available through August 11th, and again, um, just asking that you please help us to spread the word on this important next step in designing improvements to a regional CAN corridor. And you can see that um, project website below, and I can also perhaps put it in the chat or send it via email as well, so you have a direct link to that website. And that concludes my brief present presentation. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Jean. Some exciting progress. Any questions? No questions. Good, good work. Thank you. Congratulations, Jean. Progress. Yeah, it, it takes a village, right? Yeah, congratulations. I'm really excited about your grant. And I think that it's just a reflection of a lot of work. So thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. And it's super exciting about the youth pass, having youths myself. <laughs> Sounds like a very exciting plan. All right, you want to keep, want me to keep us moving? Yep. All right, All right thanks. thanks everyone. Everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks. Good night. Okay, um, Melanie Sloan is here to give us an update on CAN. Hello everyone, uh, just one moment while I start my video. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, Melanie Sloan uh, here to talk with you this evening about the uh, core arterial network. So um, just one moment while I pull up my presentation. 
presentation. Okay. So tonight I'm providing an update on the core arterial network, its initiative, work plan, funding, and specific updates on the priority corridors being Baseline Road, Iris Avenue, and Folsom Street. You've heard from several of my colleagues tonight from Lindsay to Garrett and then Jean just now about projects. So some of this might sound familiar, um, but uh, thanks so much for uh, your attention because I think we have some really good information to share. So the um, what I want you to take away from this work plan update is that the CAN initiative remains on track with 15 projects on eight of the 13 corridors. Um, having funding or being active in planning, design, and or construction in 2023 and 2024, as shown on this map. You can see the eight CAN corridors with active projects shown in pink, and the three priority corridors highlighted in yellow. And I'll share updates uh, on those in a few slides. So when we uh, look at that list, we know many of those projects benefit from grant funds. In 22, the city was successful in gaining $10.7 million for CAN projects through various grant pursuits. In 23, we continued to pursue grant funding for CAN infrastructure through two grants, the Denver Regional Council of Governments 24 to 27 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, and the Colorado Department of Transportation's 2024 to 26 Transportation Alternatives Program, or TAP. And I'm pleased to announce that three additional CAN corridor projects received funding from the TIP and the TAP in 23. That initiates work on each of those in the first quarter of 25. Those are called out on this map. And from north to south, it's design and construction of the 28th Street multi-use path from Four Mile Canyon Creek to J Road, a project that you're familiar with from prior TIP funding discussions. Preliminary design and community engagement for Folsom Avenue from Pine Street to Colorado Avenue. That's a CAN priority corridor. And engagement and design of multimodal transportation improvements on 30th Street from Colorado to Baseline Road and funds for construction of those from Colorado Avenue to Aurora Avenue. And uh, Garrett spoke to that one a bit earlier. So it's the same project. But what I want to do tonight um, in this brief time together is really focus on those three priority corridors, Baseline, Iris, and Folsom. So let's look in more detail at those. Starting with the first priority corridor, Baseline Road, from 30th Street to Foothills Parkway, that's being implemented in two phases. In phase one, leverages planned pavement resurfacing to gain those safety benefits now between 28th Street and Foothills Parkway, as you see in this diagram. The changes are informed by what we heard from the community in the fall, and they address themes of reducing vehicle speeds, making intersections safer and more comfortable to travel through, and providing more separation between people biking and driving. And that phase one work is ongoing and will wrap up in November. So phase two of the baseline project will provide more significant changes to the corridor between 30th Street and Foothills Parkway. That begins in the first quarter of 24 once tip funding is available. Um, the community engagement strategy for phase two, it will be informed by staff's participation in design for civic change fellowship that will build skills for inclusive and equitable engagement that will also benefit other CAN corridor work. So the second priority corridor is Iris Avenue from Broadway to 28th Street that focuses on making travel on Iris safer, more comfortable and more connected. Related but separate work to improve the crossing at 15th Street and Iris is anticipated to begin in the fall of this year. And as Jean was talking about, we have this really wonderful project on the future diagonal bikeway east of 28th Street. And so planned connections to Iris from there are also being contemplated in related efforts. In spring of 23, for IRIS, contract, staff contracted with consultants to support community engagement, data analysis, and engineering. And then throughout this year, the project team is going to focus on listening to the community through equitable and meaningful engagement, as well as collecting information on existing conditions, including multimodal travel data. And then design development, alternatives analysis, and initiation of a community and environmental assessment process, or SEEP, 
will begin in early 24 after community input and data is collected and analyzed. The third priority corridor is Folsom from Pine to Colorado Avenue. And that project is between previously implemented protected bike lanes on Folsom from Valmont to Pine and planned improvements on Colorado Avenue from Regent, excuse me, Regent to Folsom. And it will follow planned traffic and pedestrian signal crossing improvements at Folsom and Pine to be made in 2024. Those TIP funds, they are available the first quarter of 25, 2025, excuse me, and will initiate community engagement and advanced conceptual design. That planned project on Colorado Avenue was not awarded TIP funds, but is ranked in the top five on the TIP waitlist for a potential award if additional funds are identified by Dr. Cog for waitlisted projects. So after tonight, staff will uh, submit an information item to council <clears throat> um, at their July 20th meeting. It will provide a bit more of a comprehensive overview of what I've shared with you tonight, the initiative, work plan, and funding strategy, as well as those updates on those corridors. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Melanie. There's a lot going on there. There is a lot. Good work. I'm sure we'll come back to these in more detail moving forward, but are, are there any pressing questions for Melanie tonight? Not seeing any hands from, oh, Brian? Oops, I can't hear you, Ryan. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Thanks, mm -hmm. Melanie. Uh, just a quick yeah. question, um, big picture. So heads up, Natalie. Um, <laughs> I am uh, just really incredibly impressed with the work of CAN over the last year, two years. It's just there's so much happening here, um, so much to be proud of uh, for the team here. And I note that looking ahead, it's it, it's a multi-year project that goes out a ways and it goes out beyond the timeline of the current city council's two-year work plan. And so as a city, the city council uh, thinks about CAN and looks to the future, can you say anything about what a CAN looks like within being uh, enshrined in a two-year work plan or versus one that is not? Does it make a difference to staff? Um, I realize this might be like a bigger question than you can easily answer, but you know, council as council thinks about what's going forward, we can I think it you know might be of interest. Thank you, Melanie. Do you want me to? Take a... <laughs> I'm sure Pack we all you have up thoughts Natalie. on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think so. It's a good question, Ryan, and I think. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully what's obvious is in the work that we're doing that there's longevity to it, right? Mm -hmm. The um, the funding that we've pursued is obviously well into the future. It commits us to work mm -hmm. being done into the future. Um, and, and I think, you know, what I continue to talk about with the team is that, you know, the work that we're doing with the CAN, we've we've kind of organized it and structured it in a bit of a different way, but it's always been work that's in the transportation master plan and in past transportation master plans, um, we've just focused the work to be structured um, in a kind of a work plan that is easy to communicate, easy mm -hmm. to kind of tell a story. Um, and we've been able to to focus the work and, and our resources to align to that. So, um, you know, whether a future council wants to call it can or not, you know, the, I think the work is going to live on. So I guess that's my kind of personal mm -hmm. opinion about it, but I think we've talked about that as a department and I've certainly talked about it with um, the city manager's office in that way. So I don't know, Melanie, if you have anything to add. Mm -hmm. Or, or others, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the maps are a really powerful communication tool. And to my, I mentioned earlier in talking about the CIP, I think a map showing the CIP projects would show how much is, has been done. And then we might get to it a little bit more later when Trini and I provide an update on our work to support council and primarily their focus on CAN. Having a map of what's missing can illustrate the, the needs um, of places to focus. So I think the, the more maps that show the different, the, 
show the status of different segments of different streets because like as we heard during public comment even 30th street block by block it changes pretty rapidly whether something's mm -hmm. been studied designed funded it's it's all over the place and i right. think maps are a really powerful tool to to show um the status of everything and, and where we can what to be proud of and, and what we need to mm -hmm. to fund moving forward yeah, I'll say Melanie and the team have worked hard on developing um, a memo for council to provide an update similar to what we're doing for you tonight um, on all the work today. And one of the things I think we're thinking about doing is having a map in there that really shows really everything that she just talked about around what's been funded, um, what has yet to be funded, you know, what's waitlisted, um, what we're continuing to pursue. So, um, and, and, you know, as we've applied for tip cycles and stuff, that's the way we've been able to communicate what it is that we're pursuing. So I agree the using the map is an effective way to do that. Awesome. Anything else for Cam tonight? Becky? I'll just add that I've seen some of the changes on baseline as I'm hmm. uh, moving around and it's been really exciting. Um, I can already kind of feel feel the difference with some of those changes. So I just I, I really appreciate um, that work and excited that there's even more to come. So thank you. Thanks, Becky. Okay. Thanks, Melanie. Mm, thanks, everyone. Natalie. Yes, more we've got. Yeah, we've got one more. Mark Schisler is with us to provide an update on a CMPI project. Yeah, so good evening, Tab. So my computer just did a somersault and did a reset right before this presentation, which is pretty terrifying. <laughs> so um, if for any reason I freeze out, Daniel Sheeter is gonna take over. So let me share my screen. So Veronica, it looks like I am disabled in sharing my screen. Is that working now? It is. Very good. All right. Are you guys able to see the presentation? Yes. yes. Awesome. Thanks, you. OK. So good evening, Tab. Uh, my name is Mark Schistler, and I'm a project manager in the Transportation and Mobility Department. Uh, tonight, I'll be sharing information about our project staff has recently kicked off and is focused on developing speed limit setting and signing practices. So at the end of the presentation, we will be asking you to select a TAB representative and alternate uh, to be part of the community working group. So please keep that in mind as we're going through tonight's presentation. So we're going to talk about the project's background, uh, purpose and goals, including the budget and funding sources, give an overview of the scope and schedule, and lastly, talk about next steps, and then make that uh, tab action request. So background, uh, earlier this year, we finalized our five-year Vision Zero action plan. Uh, this project originates directly from that action item, or from an action item, um, within that plan, which is to update and implement Boulder's policies and practices regarding speed limit setting to better align and target uh, and actual operating speeds. Um, so we understand that speed limit setting and signing is just one piece of the overall puzzle in aligning target and operating speeds. Other puzzle pieces that complement this work are designing construction standards and practices and speed management. So physical speed mitigation devices and enforcement, uh, traditional and automated. So each contributing and overlapping with each other as they work to help eliminate serious injury and fatal crashes. So before diving into the project's purpose and goals, I'd like to provide a historical context with how the city has set speed limits and installed speed limit signs over the last several decades. So changes in speed limits have been on uh, typically shorter roadway segments, typically completed by consultants uh, who do use a context sensitive approach However, this has led to some inconsistent outcomes. Um, speed limit signing has primarily been at the discretion of the city traffic engineer, which uh, is a personal preference, and we've had many of them. So this has led to inconsistencies in signing size 
and placement along corridors. So what's the purpose of this project? Uh, the speed limit setting and signing practices project will incorporate industry best practices to develop a framework and improve the consistency for establishing and communicating speed limits citywide, uh, continuing the effort to reduce speed related crashes on city owned collectors and arterials. So we're going to get there by developing a quantitative citywide approach and practice for speed limit setting and signing and creating a transparent document to share that methodology with the community and its stakeholders. Uh, since Boulder has several state highways traversing through the city, um, staff is uh, partnering with the Colorado Department of Transportation as uh, they are also working on developing a new methodology for speed limit setting. So we do have a seat at the table and we are currently working on a pilot study with them on South Broadway. So that's pretty exciting. So the total uh, budget for the project is $125,000. Um, 103,488 is funded through Dr. Cox's Community Mobility Planning and Implementation Grants. And then the remaining $21,512 is funded by the Transportation Mobility Department. And this is a really great example of staff for leveraging grant opportunities to complete Vision Zero actions. So there are five tasks that guide this project. Uh, the first is community engagement, peer agency and best practices review, uh, speed limit setting and signing methodology, that public facing documents, and then lastly, speed limit and signing recommendations. There are three components to the project's community engagement, the transportation advisory board, stakeholder engagements, and the project's website. Uh, we anticipate three touch points with TAB. The first is tonight, sharing an overview of the project. We'll then come back to share the draft methodology, and then lastly, share the final results. Our stakeholder engagements will be both internal and external. The internal group will include planning and development services, Boulder Police Department, Boulder Fire and Rescue, along with other departments. As part of the community stakeholder working group, we anticipate to work with the Transportation Advisory Board, Community Cycles, the Center for People with Disabilities, and Boulder Transportation Connections. So these groups will um, essentially be able to provide feedback on peer city and best practices to be considered as staff develops our methodology. And then lastly, we'll have an updated website where staff will inform the public about the project. And this will also include a direct uh, communication link to city staff. So here's a high level summary of the remaining four tasks. Staff will be reviewing best practices described by the National Association of City Transportation Officials, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, and the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, and we'll also have discussions with peer agencies that have developed similar methodologies. Uh, we'll take what we've learned and through conversations with our stakeholder groups, uh, develop a methodology tailored for Boulder. Staff will then take that tailored methodology along with how it was developed and create a public facing document. Staff will use this document to review collectors and arterials citywide and develop recommendations for any speed limit changes, uh, including signing. And then note this methodology isn't just for existing roadways, uh, but also for capital projects. So we can directly where we can directly influence the project's infrastructure design to align with a recommended speed limit. So overall, we anticipate a six to eight month timeline for the project. Community engagement will be ongoing. Peer review and method, uh, methodology developments will occur this summer and fall. And then using the methodology and implementing any changes to the system will begin in early 2024. And then depending on the extent of what those recommendations are, uh, implementation may be out of scope for this project and will be coordinated in late 2024 and beyond. All right, next steps. Uh, so we have our first community stakeholder working group meeting tentatively scheduled for the week of July 24th. We've begun investigating uh, industry best practices and having conversations with peer cities leading into our methodology development in September. And we're planning to come back to TAB in the fall to share that draft methodology for your feedback. All right, so here's the fun part. Um, we do have a request of TAB to participate in the community working group. Uh, we're looking for one representative and an alternate. Uh, here's an outline of expectations and commitments. Uh, partner with the city and actively participate in those group discussions. We anticipate roughly two or three meetings, uh, six to eight hours total, 
which will be held virtually or in person. person. Uh, we also anticipate two to four hours of homework, uh, which will be uh, essentially investigating slash reviewing speed limit and setting signing practices from other agencies and then providing feedback on staff's draft methodology. So Alex, if it's okay with you, I'll hand it over to you so TAP can discuss this request from staff. Yeah, thanks, Mark. This is exciting stuff and it's, it's good to see you again. Yeah, you too, man. Um, I'm always interested in modernizing the way we think about traffic engineering. So I'd throw my name in the hat. Are there any other people on the board that would be excited about serving as the representative for alternate for this? Uh, I'd be happy to do either, either alternate or representative. Okay, Ryan, Cherney. I don't see any. Becky, would you mind if I was the primary and you were the backup on this? Yeah, go for it. Awesome, thanks. It looks like it'll wrap up around before my my term is up, so won't be dropping off before then. Awesome. So Alex, you'll be the representative and then Becky will be the alternates. Looking forward to working with you too. And then lastly, if you guys have any questions, comments, uh, and feedback, feel free to contact me directly. Um, and thanks so much for your time this evening. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Yeah, looking forward to being a part of this and reporting back to Tab about the, the process. Thank Should be you, fun. Mark. You're welcome. All right, our final matters item is an update on our safe streets and roads for all application and Garrett and Devin will be co-presenting. Yes, good evening again. So happy to share with you that a few days ago, we submitted our 2023 safe streets for all application to the Federal Highway Administration and the department, Federal Department of Transportation. It was a big effort that entailed a lot of staff time and a lot of support from some of our consulting partners to uh, bring the application to fruition. And it uh, was perhaps uh, one of the most multi-collaborative efforts that the, the department has ever put forward in a, in a grant application. And the way that the application started with a considerable amount of data that had gone into the preparation of the Boulder Safe Streets Report and the Vision Zero Action Plan as the basis for figuring out what we wanted to include in the application, then working with the planning team to help us figure out how we might put that into a, a narrative and a theme, and then from the capital project side to put some costing and estimates together, as well as some schedules. And so the, Application, uh, I'll just want to say uh, and, and give some kudos to the work that has gone before this application. It could not have happened without all the tremendous effort that went into the Vision Zero Action Plan and the Safe Streets. Uh, we would have, there's just, there's no way it would have happened at all. So it's, uh, it's great that we were in a place that we were ready to pursue that because of that body of work. I feel like our application is going to be really competitive um, because of that, but also because Boulder has been so proactive in a number of other ways. I think um, that we were able to point to our community and strategic engagement framework plan, that we have a racial equity plan, that we have our own racial equity mapping, that we have an ADA transition plan, we have a transportation master plan that's been updated as recently as 2019. We have a sustainability, equity, and resiliency framework. We have a green infrastructure plan, the comprehensive flood study. They, they were curious to know about our asset management systems, that if they're going to give us a big chunk of funding, what are we going to do to take care of that? So we were able to speak to our advanced and mature systems for being able to take care of the assets that we are experienced with asset management. And then um, also, of course, the low stress walk and bike network were integral to the application. So all of this work that's been going on over the last many, many, many years set a strong foundation for us to put together what I believe is a really compelling application. So just a little bit about it. Uh, 
there are some very federal forms. If you've uh, done uh, had any interface with the federal government in any way, whether it be your taxes or social security or whatever the case may be, you know how crude and clunky their standard federal forms. That was no, uh, there was no exception to that uh, with this process for the Safe Streets for All application. We had our clunky federal forms we had to fill out. But where we really were able to tell our story is in the 12 page narrative where we were able to weave together the, the crash problems and types that we are trying to solve for. And all of these frameworks uh, and studies that the city is oriented towards trying to, to accomplish and, uh, and moving forward all of our goals. So um, the three problem types we specifically included in the application are pedestrian safety at unsignalized high-risk network crosswalks, prevalent crash patterns on heavily traveled can corridors, specifically Arapahoe between 28th and 33rd Street and 30th Street from Pearl to the Diagonal Highway, and prevalent crash patterns at high-risk network intersections to include uh, improvements such as addressing right turn slip lanes, tightening corner radii, installing raised medians, and uh, multi-use path crossing improvements. So in, in pursuit of solving all those problems, there was a plethora of data, as I mentioned, that went into demonstrating the need for this funding. And uh, a key component of that was computing a benefit cost ratio. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with BC ratios, that's simply uh, a, a computation of the numerical benefit divided by the numerical cost. And our ratio came out at 10 to one based off the specific guidance that was included in the notice of funding opportunity from the US Department of Transportation. So we believe that also is very compelling. The total request that we put forward for the implementation grant uh, is for about uh, almost $25 million for in total project funding. And we requested 20% local match and we would need to bring about $5 million and that would yield $20 million in grant funds that would be implemented between 2025 and 2029. The other component of the application was a planning and demonstration grant. So. In addition to working together, we held a couple of uh, meetings. Um, as some of you are aware, at the NACTO conference that was held in Denver, there was a breakout session on the SS4A application. So we grabbed some of those folks' time while we were there. We also met with representatives from the US DOT to, to get some clarification. And what we learned is that they have uh, a whole lot of money to award for planning and demonstration grants. And so we also added to our implementation grant a request for a $4 million project or $3.2 million in funding that could be awarded to help us look at the, uh, the potential for addressing right turn bypass treatments and, and various ideas and, and concepts that are out there for us to be able to make those safer crossings and, and safer intersections for all users. So uh, beyond our own organization, we had support on this effort from Colorado Department of Transportation, Boulder County, Community Cycles, the Center for People with Disabilities, the It Could Be Me, Boulder Transportation Connections, and RTD. So uh, really happy that we had that level of support for our application. And I think that is the high point. In terms of when we expect to hear, We've been told that the planning and demonstration grant awards notifications will go out in October and the implementation grant awards will go out in December. So we've got a little bit of waiting ahead of us before we get any word as to the results here. Um, Devin, if I missed anything, feel free to jump in. Yeah, thanks so much, Garrett. Um, just really excited to present this project, and I'll touch just a little bit more on the relationship and correlation to our Vision Zero Action Plan work and how we leverage that plan to inform this application and make a strong case. Um, I want to highlight that our funding request tied directly to actions two, three, six, eight, and nine. So a total of five of our 20 actions in our action plan uh, are addressed in this application. Um, action two had to do with um, 
addressing those higher cost solutions on the HRN to address top crash patterns. And we did that in our application through including all of the higher cost projects that were identified within the Vision Zero Action Plan. Uh, action three had to do with implementing capital projects to improve safety and comfort, including protected bike lanes, protected intersections, and setback multi-use path crossings on high priority HRN and CAN corridors. And we did that through uh, including uh, the Arapaho Avenue corridor and the 30th Street corridor. Um, and then we, action six had to do with updating the pedestrian crossing treatment installation guidelines and documenting relevant HSIP information for existing marked crosswalk locations that no longer meet the guidelines. And through a preliminary evaluation using FHWA and uh, Denver guidance, we identified nine locations for uh, enhancement to crossing treatment types. Um, three locations that are proposed to be changed from static signs to RRFBs, and six that are planned to be upgraded from RRFB to a pedestrian signal. Um, action eight had to do with pursuing this type of funding, and action nine had to do with the demonstration grant that Garrett dis, uh, discussed. So just really fortunate that the timing and sequencing of our work aligned in such a great way um, to transition so smoothly from the action plan completion uh, into this grant request. Awesome. Very exciting. And a lot of things seem to be clicking timeline-wise and I think less planning and more doing in the, in the near term, especially if this is successful. I know I've heard a lot of exciting things from Trini, so yeah. Trini. Yeah, no, no, I am so incredibly happy for you guys and I'm so excited and I'm sure you guys are going to get it and I'm like crossing my fingers, but <laughs> it really, <laughs> on a personal note, I mean, it's just so, so um, inspiring to see that you guys really put so much work into this and, and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to get it. Yeah. If anyone was interested in reading the application, is it available online anywhere? Uh, I don't think we've shared it online, but uh, I'm, I'm, we're happy to share it with Tab. Um, Natalie, I, 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 yeah. can I just uh, send it out to the Tab email or what's the best way? Yeah, we can send it out. Um, perhaps, yeah, if you want to just send it, just we can we can talk offline about the mechanics of it, but we'll get it sent to you. Um, yeah, and I'll, I just wanted to highlight a couple things. Um, one, just we we're also working kind of on the um, legislative front to make sure that like the delegation is aware. So we're doing what we can on that side of things to help us um, gain support for our application. Um, and then um, just the second point, I, I just wanted to again, just thank the team. There was a huge effort um, by Valerie, Garrett and Devin to really you know, all the legwork and, and of course, staff that supported them too. Um, but this was, I mean, it's a one of a kind grant opportunity and it took a one of a kind lift by our team to make it happen. Um, I think everyone's feeling a little, little tired, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's amazing. And, and now fingers crossed, hopefully we get something. Yeah, yeah definitely looking forward to the end of the year and hearing the results. Cool. Well done. Anything else from staff? That's all we have. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thanks. Now matters from the board. The only thing that made it on the agenda was about racial equity trainings. I was, I've was i signed up twice and unfortunately both have been canceled due to lack of attendees. So I was wanting to hear how many people were able to attend, but I think I since learned that Bernie, Becky, and Tila were all in the same training. Mm -hmm. correct and then ryan have you been able to attend a training yet i have attended one in the past i think i did like a pilot version of it and i can't i'm not i'm I, so i'm not sure if the of the answer to that i need to coordinate with the staff okay. to see if i've done it or not okay i just wanted to get inventory on who had done it it sounds like the city's changing their approach to how it's being offered and maybe to a monthly basis and i'll make sure to sign up again when that opens up. 
Yeah, we'll be sure. I believe they it was kind of back in their court to get a communication out to um, boards and commissions around the next training opportunity. So we'll be sure that that gets to you all when we hear something. Okay, thank you. And then the other thing I had was our homework for this meeting, which was to provide an update on what, if anything, people have done with their homework from the board retreat in May. Again, we had the three focus areas for us to um, do research, talk to staff, get ready to potentially provide recommend recommendations to the next council at their retreat. We had um, Perny and I looking at ways to support councils, uh, especially on CAN efforts. Becky and Tila looking at parking code reform, and then Ryan and Becky looking at opportunities for more coordination between departments. So I think it'd be good if we just, nothing, don't need to have anything too polished. I know Trini and I don't um, for tonight, but just a, an update. Uh, Trini and I have discussed how we think we can best support council. And uh, one opportunity we really see is emphasizing that there's a lot of more capital money needed for CAN. And so one that could be dusting off some of the work that had been done in the past to look for a new transportation funding mechanism to expand the amount of money that's available. And two, emphasize that with our current funds, there's not, we'd have to pivot away from CAN to fund something else. And so now might be a really good time to focus on policy and programmatic things the city can do uh, to keep the capital funding available for, for CAN as much as it has been in recent years. And we discussed the desire to have a, a map of all of the different CAN segments and get a sense of where the status of those are and potentially at a future board meeting under matters, try to identify a list of top five priority projects, ones that would help fill in some of the gaps that we see in the network, some that we think might be most impactful due to a variety of reasons or provide the best cost benefit. And that to be that be a list that we could uh, discuss with staff, but then also have as like a, a policy or priority recommendation for council in the future. So I'd be interested in seeing what maps um, staff might already have that would we could use to, to frame our conversation. Uh, Trini, did I miss anything from our recent talk? No, no. And I, well, I guess just the, all the, like charts that you've done to keep track of what's been done in each project, which I think was really valuable for, for um, council. I think it's really important to see where things are advancing and where things are just kind of like missing certain elements. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what she's referring to is I've, I've made a list of each segment and its status. And so like 30th Street, we've got a bunch of different segments because they're in different um, phases and it's in a list which isn't all that visual. I think uh, if there's a map of that, it would be the, the most compelling. So um, maybe reach out to Natalie and Melanie and see what all you guys have um, on hand app-wise. Um, Becky and Ryan, any update on the opportunities to coordinate between departments? Becky, do you want, do you, you want me to start or did you? I don't know if you remember we met <laughs> ways back. So so yeah, okay. uh, I can go for it. I all I have is sort of some details on North Broadway conversations. Okay. So oh okay. So on the the department interdepartmental thing uh, on that topic, we, yeah. So Becky and I met like I mean we met like right after the re retreat. So this is this point is quite a ways back. Um, I took some notes. I now I'm looking in my my files, Becky. I don't know if I actually succeeded in sharing out my notes back with you for us to move on so i this is a good uh prompt to um to do that but frankly we <laughs> we talked about parking uh, ordinance <laughs> and which we which we have um, uh, dealt with uh to some extent today in a previous agenda item and and a, a little bit regarding how city code with between you know treating land use in some cases over here and transportation over there Parking over there, housing over there, and and you know those um, there there could be an opportunity for greater um, alignment integration. That's one of the big big things I call. Um, we had a little more 
a little more detail here. Um, Becky, feel free to um, to weigh in, and then I will commit after this to sending you the latest that I have, and then I don't know um, from there what exactly to do. But I guess Becky, you want to anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, I can speak to sort of a, just was like a related piece I was looking at with just having more conversations around North Broadway, um, and specifically like, why are there possibilities, but like, what would it, I guess why this is related is because it's, from our understanding, crosses over like multiple departments per view, so it's kind of an example of a project that falls in the middle of multiple departments. Um, so it's kind of a useful case study for us for us to understand how this all works better um, or where there might be sort of challenges. So anyway, um, so I've had a few conversations around that. So my understanding was initially that um, there couldn't be any changes to North Broadway, for instance, closing the parking to try to make the bike lane safer in the northbound direction without updating the North Broad or that the, the uh, I forget what the name of it, the subcommunity plan for that area um, would need to be updated and a specific particular section of it would need to be updated. And then that would have to be a council work item and it have to go along the community engagement process. So to clarify that, I just asked legal staff and they pulled in planning staff to figure out, is this a legal requirement or is, or is this a practice or why does, why does it have to be this very prolonged process to make any change potentially if it's, you know, not a, a you know, big big change in terms of um, necessarily cost or like the uh, entire street streetscape. And they said, legally, no, you don't have like that process is not necessary. It is historical practice to do that, but it is not required per se to change a subject community plan. You don't have to go through, you don't have to have a work plan item and go through a, a long engagement process. Um, technically what's required is a vote by planning board, a public hearing with a vote by planning board and then a public hearing with a vote by council to change the section of the subcommunity plan. So that, that's what I was told by legal and planning. And then I talked to um, planning board and learned that typically they don't put forward items though. So a planning board wouldn't come forward and say, we have this idea we want to have a public hearing about. Um, they react to things that are brought to them. And um, and they have such a full plate that they it wouldn't make sense for them to be bringing forward additional things on top of that because they already have so much to do. Um, and so they'd only be considering a change if it was put in front of them by the planning department or by city manager prioritization. That's my understanding. Um, so that kind of brings me to now <laughs> um, understanding that if anything were to change, Yes, the subcommunity section of the plan would have to change to say you could prohibit parking in the northbound side, but and you know do something else with that space. Um, but it essentially would have to be a city manager priority that was communicated to planning that was put in front of planning board to have a public hearing to make the change that then would go to council and would have to be passed there as well. Um, so, so uh, that leads me to understanding. Yeah, I don't know if this is 100% correct, but my understanding now is that that kind of change would have to be a directive from the city manager at this at this particular jun junction. Um, and which leads me to wonder if it's worthwhile to have to have some kind of conversation with the city manager around that, you know, understanding that again, all the history of the project that we've talked about before, I don't have to go through again, but that the city manager does have authority here to move, to make change if, if they want to, um, without, in the name of safety, essentially. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of where I've ended up with that. <laughs> um, and whether we as a body want to get, you know, go further and recommend that a city manager make that choice, as part of, you know, prioritizing um, high injury corridors and um, being able to kind of um, make, identify what is in some, some ways, I know in all, not in all ways, but in some ways lower hanging fruit in terms, in the sense of it's not rebuilding an entire street. <laughs> um, 
but some potential way to make a street safer that the city of manager does have authority over. Granted, it would still have to be passed by planning board and city council, so I understand it's not their choice alone, but raising the issue would be the city manager's choice. So uh, that is what I learned through <laughs> my conversations about North Brad Broadway, and I'm happy to be corrected if anything I said was not quite right by anybody else's understanding. Thanks for looking into that and taking the time to meet with all the potential necessary parties. Uh, so Becky and I have talked in the past about what could possibly be done up there. I see, I would support providing something to the city manager. I think there are varying degrees of impact we could have with different costs associated. One would be to the current plan or the current street doesn't have parking on the west side of the street. However, the plan allows for an expanded parking space. And I think we've heard from people that having the cars cross the bike lane is not desirable. And so I think the lowest hanging fruit would just be to pull out the option for adding the parking. And that might create an opportunity to also change the curb. Uh, so I'd see that as like the the lowest hanging fruit. And then above that would be some sort of remediation. I don't know what it would look like for that northbound lane that Becky mentioned. And then I don't know if it could, it might not be possible to swiftly look at a, a potential long-term cross-section that as redevelopment happens, it could sort of take on a, a different form. But if there are interest, I think something to the, the city manager, CC council is something that I'd be willing to engage on in the in the future. And I think that the big motivation, it, it's a safety concern. Um, we've seen tonight how many cool things are coming all over town and in this one neighborhood with like one primary street, there's there's not one of the most diverse neighborhoods in Boulder, both from uh, ethnic demographics, income demographics. Um, there's nothing too exciting coming that way uh, in the foreseeable future. And this would be an opportunity to, to remedy that and hopefully match the, the quality of, of infrastructure that we're providing elsewhere. Natalie? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm just thinking and I'm trying to be helpful um, because I think, you know, what likely will, like I appreciate kind of the research you did, Becky, and I think where this will likely, it, it's kind of like chicken and egg <laughs> sort of thing, where this will likely come um, back to is, um, you know, whether whether it's Nuria directing, you know, the department to do this. But but typically, I mean, my my um, experience with the city manager's office is, you know, they want to understand how it's going to impact department's work plan. And and this one would impact planning and transportation's work plans, right? From um, planning development services and transportation work plan. Um, even if even if we scaled it back and didn't do community engagement and just which like technically we're still doing community engagement going to planning board um, and then council but even if we basically came up with kind of a minimal community engagement process there would be an impact to our work plan and to planning and development services work plan and so then that goes back to council right of um, what are our work plan priorities and does um, council see this as a priority uh, more so than the work that is already on the plan for planning and development services and for transportation. Um, because, I mean, I can speak for myself, you know, for the department for transportation that, that we're pretty at capacity. I mean, I would say <laughs> we're beyond capacity, right? And so um, to add this to the work plan, something's going to have to stop for a little while while we give this attention. Um, and, and I don't know what plan development services would say, but likely they would say, we don't have capacity for this. Um, if this is something council wants us to do, then they need to, um, they need to tell us that this is a priority over whatever 
of the nine other priorities that is on PNDS's work plan right now from council. Um, so I think, you know, even though, even if you, I'm, I'm just trying to be helpful because like, even if you structure this request to Nuria, it's gonna come back to the departments and it's gonna come back to, is this a priority for council to, you know, prioritize our work plans in this way. And then the final thing I'll say is, you know, in my experience, tab and or planning board and council don't like to make decisions like in a vacuum. They don't want to, um, without there being extensive community engagement, they're not going to typically, at least what I've seen, make a decision. And so um, even if we tried to kind of shortcut the process and go to just planning board and then council, I don't think they would let us. I think they would say, have you done community engagement? What have you heard from the business community on this? What have you heard from, you know, stakeholders along the corridor for the, for this? Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's both a work plan prioritization exercise for council and it's um, potentially more community engagement than than you might wish for it to be. So, I mean, that's just like my opinion or <laughs> two cents. You can take it or leave it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I I, no, I appreciate that, and I I'm sure there's always more work in a lot of these projects than I can understand, you know, just kind of from what they sound like. But um, uh, I guess my well, one, I mean, my biggest concern is just somebody's going to get very hurt or killed um, because of the way it's designed, and I feel like frequently the sort of like through this process, a lot of times the response has been, well, we don't know what the business members think, and I think. You know, if our reasoning is we don't know what the business members think, but we know that it's unsafe because of the design doesn't meet best practice standards for safety, then it's not really, you know, as a, when I, I mean, as it, it doesn't make sense to me that we would, you know, kind of defer to this a community engagement process that might result in continuance of unsafe conditions, because then we're sort of, it feels like we're kind of setting ourselves up for failure in future CAN projects where we're going to get the same exact feedback. You know, somebody's going to say, no, you can't do that because I don't like it. And then we won't build it. And then we're going to end up with the same outcome. So that's part of my fear <laughs> is that this is like, it's not going to, that feedback's not going to change because it's the same in every every single city, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and so having this sort of political will that says, yes, we will do something about a situation that's unsafe because safety is the number one priority. So that's like one of my concerns is sort of allowing that to be the kind of dominant narrative. And also I think part of what in having these conversations I run into is a sort of different, like a sort of, and not, not in what you're, you're saying on Natalie, but um, it's sort of this sort of reference to, well, we have the sub-community plan that dictates what can be done. And I think it's, it's not, like letting the sort of piece of paper be the thing that we use to defend why we can't do something is a bit of a like abdication of responsibility for decision makers ability to change outcomes as well. So, um, I mean, I hear the sort of capacity piece and if council needs to put forth, I don't know, attached funding to it or something for it to happen, then, you know, maybe that is a bigger conversation, but having just completed something where somebody could, like if somebody gets hurt or killed, I want to be able to explain to the public why that happened. And I, it feels likely that that's going to happen because of the design or that way. So, you know, I don't want the defense to be that it was this piece of paper or, you know, like it just, it's really hard to accept that when we're making so many high priorities of these other places where people get injured throughout the city, why this one, priority when we just got all this attention. Um, so, so I don't know. I swear I like going through this long community engagement process to end up with something else. I don't know. It just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right. And it doesn't feel like it sets us up well for the future. Um, if that's kind of where we land each time. I don't know. It, it's just really hard to <laughs> accept, to be honest, that like, this is, that this is kind of where we birthed. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that, Becky. And it feels like I, I feel like I bear some responsibility for this and where the some of the limited people, it sounds like if the city staff is not understandably have the capacity to do anything, we're some of the rare people in a position to say something and it feels like we're morally obligated to keep 
trying and raising it to the, the people who could set something into motion. Um, obviously not going to solve it tonight, so perhaps we could pick this up at an agenda meeting or, or at another time. Ryan, I saw you unmuted earlier. Did you have something on this? Yeah, I'm just. It just reminded me that um, I, I mean, this goes back to what I said earlier that like the, the, this this it seems like the strong force here is is re, is available resources and that there should be a political slash values decision about are we going to pursue choices as a city do things to improve um, to make life better. I mean, if you look at what IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says about the ways city carbonization give you cost curves and they show you that, that public transit and walking and biking are cost uh, negative, pay money back. It's not, it should not be complicated that these are, that, that making a completely safe and transit rich environment, is something we can do and we can afford to do it and make life better. But it's, staff can't just do it on its own. It's something that needs to go to city council to consider what, what the strategic options are. And this seems to me like one of those, this question of, the, of where we don't have the resources we don't and that's not staff's fault you know and if it, that, that's something that's a political decision that we need to put on the table where it, where it needs to be and i think some of the other answers will become easier if we can do that unfortunately it's not super super fast um in terms of remedies um so anyway this will um this is helping me to remember some of the um the the documentation that i had started putting together becky following our discussion so i'm going to reanimate that and send that your way and then perhaps we can circulate it with um, the rest of the board Okay, and that might need to come in a meeting versus right, not. right, right, right. Okay, I'll get that okay. little thought and then propose. Yeah, propose something. Okay, I think that's that's enough on the the second um, item. More to come, just like the first one. Uh, Becky, do you have an update on the parking code reform that you and Tila are working on? Yeah, this will be really short. We don't, we we haven't gotten very far on. Uh, that discussion, I was mostly focused on the other conversations um, around North Broadway. So um, more to come on that. OK, yeah, no worries. We got half a year before the, the retreat. So um, plenty of time to refine these and reach out to the, the relevant boards, if there are some, to try to and, and council members and candidates to gain traction and support for these ideas. Natalie? Yeah, I was just going to um, kind of highlight what Samantha mentioned in her presentation earlier today uh, or tonight um, around the TDM ordinance update and um, the parking code update. So the those two work items have kind of been on the back burner. And, and I think this is somewhat what um, kind of instigated the work item at the retreat for you all. To, to kind of help gain traction for that work. So what I, I'll just say is um, staff is starting to talk about that being on the work plan for 2024. Um, that's highly dependent on council priorities. And so, um, you know, basically, uh, as long as other priorities don't take away all the capacity in PNDS and transportation to do that work, then I think um, there's good likelihood that that could be on the 2024 work plan. So that's, I thought would be positive news for you all because I know that um, that's something that TAB has been looking forward to for a long time, so. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess Ryan just touching on one more thing. Um, do we have a date for the CIP bike tour? Artist says yes. Um, yes, everybody is available on the 24th. So I'll send that out. I just wanted to kind of get a general check that good to go. I believe so. Okay. And yeah. Tila, yeah. Agree. Awesome. Thank you for your assistance and in, in the setting up the poll for that. Okay. Thank you. And then this will be our last meeting before then. I know sometimes people have certain requests on different projects, either things that are underway or areas that we've talked about. Um, and so if anyone has any 
thoughts. Uh, Garrett in the past has welcomed um, input on any suggestions as he develops the, the route for it. Is that true, Garrett? That is correct. I appreciate you flagging that, Alex. Happy to accommodate any requests uh, so that we can put together a route that accommodates those. Yeah, thank you. But with that being in, in two weeks, try to get those in, in sooner rather than later. That's all I had for matters. Any other board members? Trini? Well, I just want to share something that maybe I, I, I hope that it's appropriate. It's just something that I'm super excited about and that you guys are going to start seeing in the street. And so um, is it okay if I share something? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, wait a minute. It may not be as easy as I thought. Um, it's not really. Oh, my gosh. Okay, hold on. Yeah, I can't share my screen for some reason. No, oh, maybe there. Uh, you should be able to share if you click on the share screen button on the bottom with the arrow. Yeah, no, it was in my settings. Something's wrong. Oh, no, it's gonna, I have to quit the, well, I'll just, I'll just email it to you guys. Um, it's a shame because it would have been really, really even a better note, but, um, it says I have to quit Zoom in order to be able to share it, so. Uh, sorry, Paul. Well, looking forward to, <laughs> if you don't want to share with us verbally, looking forward to, to well, seeing yeah. what it is. So um, for years, I've been trying to do this and somehow it just all came together. And um, in, con well, in collaboration with CDOT, we're going to launch this messaging campaign to kind of raise awareness about the safe systems approach which was a challenge within itself, but um, just sharing the basic concepts so people can get a little bit more familiar with what we mean, what we talk, when we talk about the safe systems approach, we chose to focus on safety on speed. And so it's this whole campaign. We're gonna have five flat iron buses. We're gonna have five buses here in Boulder. We're gonna have bus shelters. We're gonna have, um, there's a giant um, screen that Union Station, we're gonna have that. So we have different um, things that I wanted to share with you guys, visuals, but so it's super exciting and yeah, <laughs> um, but I can't share it. So thank you. Yep. <laughs> I'll send you guys an email, um, yep. but it'll be live um, at the end of July, first week of August, and it'll be around for three months. So. Awesome. Yeah, congrats again. I remember you telling me this was something you were aspiring to do for a while, and then everything sort of fell into place and have a, a multi-month campaign with, what was it, five flat iron flyers, and we have a lot of visibility. So, congrats. Thank you. So. Any other matters or exciting bits of news from the board? Not seeing anything. Um, on the future agenda topics, it's blank, but I'm sure something will come up. Yes, we we have um, a couple items the next couple of months that we're we're trying to balance between the between August and September. So um, more to come, and if we for some reason have nothing in August, we will let you all know. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, thank you. With that, I think that completes the agenda and we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. We have the motion turning with the second. All those in favor? Unanimous with four votes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Good night. Everyone. Thank you.